Hi, listeners. This is the 80,000 Hours Podcast, where each week we have an unusually in-depth conversation about one of the world's most pressing problems and how you can use your career to solve it. I'm Rob Wiblin, Director of Research at 80,000 Hours. Today's interview with Professor Philip Tetlock was recorded last week at Effective Altruism Global San Francisco. We last interviewed Tetlock back in November 2017 for episode 15. It's a great episode, which I can recommend going back and listening to, as it'll give you more context, but doing so isn't necessary to make sense of today's conversation. Philip is the Annenberg University professor at the University of Pennsylvania, a legendary social scientist and a personal hero of mine. He spent the better part of 40 years collecting forecasts about the future from tens of thousands of people to try to figure out how accurately people can predict the future and what sorts of thinking styles allow people to do the best job of it. He was co-principal investigator of the Good Judgment Project, a many-year study of the feasibility of improving the accuracy of probability judgments of high-stakes real-world events. His research has resulted in over 200 articles in peer-reviewed journals and two books, Super Forecasting, The Art and Science of Prediction, and Expert Political Judgment, How Good Is It and How Can We Know? Why go and interview Philip a second time? Firstly, in 2017, I actually only got an hour with him, and I simply had a lot more questions to ask. Second, I believe Philip's work is really the uh, sine qua non of, of, of being rational and having good judgment. And as a result, uh, it's relevant to everyone, uh, no matter what they're doing. Making accurate predictions is just essential for, for good decision making in your own life. For instance, if you can't predict your probability of success in different career paths, you're obviously going to find it really hard to choose between them. And that's just a uh, big picture example. Correctly assessing the likelihood of things is important everywhere in, in life on, on an hourly basis, whether you're deciding whether to, to call your bank to try to resolve a problem, uh, to apologize to someone you had a fight with, or uh, what to put in your suitcase for, for a trip overseas. Third, at 80,000 hours, uh, we're especially interested in what impact advanced AI might have on the world. And for that, it's really useful to know what capabilities AI is going to have at different points in time. Uh, needless to say, that's exceedingly hard, but, but the lessons from Tedlock's work uh, give us as good a shot as possible of producing sensible estimates. Fourth, uh, improving judgment and foresight seem especially important for long-termists like me, who want to make the world better not just today, but for the thousands of generations who may yet be to come. It can be really hard to figure out what things we can change about the world uh, today uh, that will consistently point it in the right direction over hundreds or thousands of years. But improving humanity's capability to correctly foresee the effect of our actions seems like a pretty good guess for something that will help. As a result, uh, a lot of people uh, believe this is among the most promising uh, broad interventions to positively shape uh, the long-term future of humanity. Fifth, People who love uh, Philip's research also tend to love 80,000 hours. So if you've uh, just been tempted to tune in for the first time uh, for this interview, welcome to the party. Uh, go check out our website, 80,000hours.org, and hopefully you'll learn a lot of things that you'll find useful. Sixth and finally, our biggest donor, the Open Philanthropy Project, have also funded the creation of a tool that will help you better calibrate your probability estimates and hopefully thereby make better decisions. We've put that on our website and we'll link to it from the show notes. All right, uh, just before we get to that, though, uh, as I said, uh, this interview was recorded uh, recently at Effective Altruism Global San Francisco, where Philip was a speaker. Effective Altruism Global is the conference of people interested in using evidence and careful analysis to do as much good as possible. If you enjoy this conversation, maybe you should get yourself along to one of those events as well. The next big one is in London, the weekend of the 18th to 20th of October. And for Antipodeans like me, there's a smaller one coming up in Sydney on the weekend of the 28th and 29th of September. You can find out more about both of those at eaglobal.org. All right, that was a bit of a do there. But without any more of it, here's Philip Tetlock. Thanks for returning to the podcast, Philip. Well, thank you. So we plan to talk about uh, new results in forecasting research. But first, uh, what are you working on right at the moment? And why do you think it's uh, important work? At this very moment, uh, I am working on what you might think of as the opposite of forecasting. I'm working on backward reasoning in time as opposed to forward reasoning in time. What does that look like? Well, it looks like um, what people in the research literature call counterfactuals. What would have happened if history had taken, on, uh, taken a different turn at various points? So this is the tournament involving um, Civilization V, is that right? Well, the reason for uh, uh, starting the research in simulated worlds as opposed to the real world is because historical counterfactuals in the real world are unknowable. Historical counterfactuals are a source of almost endless ideological friction and debate. When we started the forecasting tournaments, there, there, were, there was a huge debate, for example, about the role of the Reagan administration and, the, and the, uh, its, its tactics for dealing with the Soviet Union. 
and whether Reagan was either bringing us closer to a nuclear war or whether Reagan was actually uh, bringing us closer to world peace. It was very polarizing, and people disagreed completely on where, where things were going. And after the fact, when, when the outcomes were known, everybody claimed to be able to explain what happened. Uh, so even though their expectations were very different, everybody wound up in a place where they, <laughs> they felt comfortable with their preconceptions. Conservatives felt that Reagan had won the Cold War, and liberals felt that the Cold War ended would have, would have ended pretty much the way it did uh, without Reagan, uh, with a two-term Carter presidency and a Mondale follow-up. So in, in this tournament, uh, you're setting people up in particular situations uh, in, in Civilization V, uh, this, kind of, this kind of famous computer game, and then I guess like changing, changing the scenario a little bit and then getting people to forecast what will happen and seeing how accurately they can forecast what would have happened if the starting conditions had been a little bit different? That's right. Um, you're able to do something in the simulated world you can't do in the real world. You can go back in time and you can say, well, what if something different had to happen at turn 100? How would the various aspects of the world have changed? Whether, you know, you change President Reagan or you change President Trump or you change um, whether the, the magnitude of the recession in 2008, whether Bernanke was leading the Federal Reserve. You've got a long list of things you can change uh, in economics or in politics or in military affairs. And people just deeply disagree about, about these things, and they can disagree forever because nobody can go back in their time machine, rerun history, and see what would have happened. So the, the peculiar thing in, in the real world is how comfortable we are uh, making pretty strong factual claims uh, that turn out on close inspection to be counterfactual. Uh, every, every time you claim you know whether someone was a good or a bad president or whether someone was a, made a good or a bad policy decision, you're implicitly making claims about how the world would have unfolded in an alternative universe to which you have no empirical access. You have only your imagination. So do we have existing research on how, people, how good people are at kind of factual reasoning? Or, or, or does the fact that we can't go down these alternative histories basically meant that people haven't been able to research this? Well, what we know about counterfactual reasoning in the real world is that it's very ideologically self-serving, uh, that people pretty much invent counterfactual scenarios that are convenient and prop up their preconceptions. So for conservatives, it's pretty much self-evident that, that without Reagan, the Cold War would have continued and might have well have gotten much worse because the Soviets would have seen weakness and they would have pushed further. Uh, and for liberals, it was pretty obvious that the Soviet Union was economically collapsing and that things would have happened pretty much the way they did. And Reagan managed to waste hundreds of billions of dollars in unnecessary defense expenditures. So you get these polar opposite positions um, that people can entrench in indefinitely. I guess because they'll never know. So it's like you, you have a free hand to be particularly ideological about these cases. Right. It's, a, it's as if, you know, you're doing uh, clinical trials in medicine and you, you got to make up the data in the control group. You, you never had to actually run the control group. You just say, you know, let's just make up the data and we'll, <laughs> just, you know what, all of our treatments are working. <laughs> Lo and behold. <laughs> So to get a large enough sample for uh, yeah to, to figure out like how accurately people can assess kind of factual outcomes or how, yeah how, how well they can do the comparison I guess do you have to have hundreds of people playing Civilization Five for like many years and then making lots of predictions about different scenarios like yeah what's 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 the scale of the enterprise here? Well, that would that would certainly be one way of doing it. Um, I, I, I think that uh, the research sponsor IARPA is not quite that patient. I, I think they would like to see. Uh, a steeper rising learning curve and uh, the, probably a smaller number of participants generating the learning. My hunch is that to do really well in this game is going to require uh, a mixture of content knowledge. We, we need people who are really good at playing Civ Five, who have a, a strategic savvy, but also people who are aware that strategic savvy doesn't readily translate into forecasting skill. So we've certainly found that there are some people who know a lot about Civ V who uh, don't necessarily make very accurate forecasts. Uh, and there are other people who don't know that much about Civ V and use some pretty simple statistical rules um, and, and do reasonably well. But I, I don't think we've reached the optimal performance frontier by any means. I think we're lagging. And if people would like to volunteer, and they should feel free to contact me. If people have knowledge of Civ Five and would be willing to donate 20 to 40 hours of time playing in a pretty intense research competition in the middle of August, and in, in return for you know, somewhat modest compensation, but not non-trivial, then they should feel free to contact me. I guess normally people don't get compensated at all for playing computer games, so, so, so anything is a step up. Right. Well, they're not playing a computer game. They're actually doing forecasting. 
Oh, they, okay. they're, they're watching the they're watching artificial intelligence agents that represent civilizations playing a computer game. And then there the question is, how skillfully can they make sense of that particular run of history? I see. So, so the humans don't actually play the game. They just look at the scenarios and try to predict who's going to win or what, what, yeah, what outcomes will, will happen. And I suppose, I suppose that speeds things up a lot because the AIs can play much faster than people can. That's, that's correct. What, what, what you see is what they call a world report. You get to see how the, how the game unfolded. And the, the question is, how deep an understanding can you extract from seeing that history how deep an understanding can you extract of the causal principles driving the game? Yeah, I was surprised when you said that, that there's people who are good at playing Civ Five, good at winning, but not terribly good at making forecasts. Because it seems like in order to be good at playing the game, don't you have to kind of be good at making forecasts about like what will happen in the game if you if you take different actions? It seems like they're, they're, they're almost the almost the same skill. It, you know, I think that's a great question, and I was working with that more or less that 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 assumption myself. Um, but it, it it seems that for the for the counterfactual questions that are being posed in in a simulation that is as complex as Civ Five, where the the combinatorics are staggering and, and the number of possible states of civilizations and variables probably is greater than the number of atoms in the universe, that even pretty, even very skilled Civ Five players um, will have serious blind spots that can be exploited by clever question posers. It's interesting. Because it's possible that they have some kind of gut intuition about like what what action is going to be best, but then between like you know uh, between other actions that they're not seriously considering, they they, they don't have the, the trained intuition to, to handle those very well. We don't have an, a detailed enough understanding yet of what exactly is going wrong. We think that the winning model is going to be. Uh, Human beings, they're, 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 in this competition, by the way, machine learning is not allowed. So, you know, we're well aware that, uh, and IARP is well aware that you, you could just put machine learning to the task and it could run the game millions of times and it put Alpha Zero in there and um, Dennis is going to kill it. Which is going to be <laughs> the, the world champion of Civ Five as well as <laughs> countless other games. Yeah. So we're, we're aware of that. That's, that's why the range of research you're allowed, we're allowed to do on Civ Five is so restricted. We're, we're only allowed to look at correlations, essentially. We're not allowed to, to do the counterfactual thought experiments ourselves. Uh, in a sense, they're, they're putting us in the same position of ignorance as actual intelligence analysts would be when they're trying to make sense of the world. Uh, when, when, you know, when intelligence analysts are doing a postmortem on policy toward Iraq or Iran or any other part of the world, they, they can't go back in history and rerun. Uh, they have to try to figure out what would have happened from the clues that are available. And those clues are a mixture of, of things. Some of them are, are going to be more beliefs about causation, the personalities and, and capacities of individuals and organizations. Others are going to even be more statistical, economic time series and things like that. So it's going to be a real challenge. I mean, this is research in progress. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm inevitably, I have to be more tentative and uh, I'm speculating. But I'm guessing we're looking for hybrid thinkers. We're looking for thinkers who are comfortable with statistical reasoning, but also have a good deal of strategic savvy and also recognize that, well, maybe my strategic savvy isn't quite as savvy as I think it is. <laughs> so I have to be careful. Do you have any view at this point on how uh, likely we are to be able to generalize from Civilization V to, to, to the real world? Well, that's a that's that's the that's the really big question because um, I, I think it's safe to assume that the that the U.S. intelligence community is not all that curious about who's better at forecasting in the Civ Five uh, computer games. Uh, I think the hope is that if you can identify methods of enhancing accuracy, enhancing the performance of human teams making sense of Civ Five games, that those methods will transfer to uh, better performance in the real world. Uh, now, how exactly you make that inferential leap, that, that, that's a complicated question. Can I venture to suggest that it actually might not be too bad? Because although it's kind of a simplified version of the, of the real world, like, yeah, civilization, you know, the, the game board is a very simplified version of like things that are actually going on in the real world. To some extent, like when we try to do forecasts, we have, we have to like create this like sim simplified schema in, in, in our own minds that might well end up kind of resembling something like the, 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 the board on Civ 5 and trying to map out the, the plays that people can make. We, we can't model the full complexity of the world. All we can like model is something that's like on the level of the simplicity of, of, of Civ 5. So maybe it's like, yeah, even if the real world is different, uh, it's, it's going to be like not so dissimilar from how we actually uh, tr try to make forecasts. I think that's fair. I, I think the, the, the Civ Five world has three basic uh, similarities with, with, with the real world. One is the complexity of causation. 
You've got um, many variables influencing many other variables, and you have feedback loops among variables. So you have negative and positive feedback loops, and you've got interactive causation. Complexity of causation is a big similarity. Uh, another similarity is, is, is path dependency, that once you've gone down a certain path, you can't re go, go back. You, that, that, so there are certain, certain categories of effects compound once, once you've made certain, certain moves. Uh, some, some events are irreversible in their consequences, or extremely difficult to reverse. And then finally, uh, randomness or, uh, or stochasticity. Um, the, they're, 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 the artificial intelligence agents uh, have a certain amount of randomness built into their, 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 their play. And that's probably an essential property to prevent them from being very easily exploitable. Uh, so there may, maybe some game theory sense underlying that. At any rate, we, we don't know how much randomness there is woven into the AIs because we're not allowed to look at the programming code. I mean, oh. that, that we're, we're not, and so the, these are all... So, so, so even you aren't allowed so, to look. So, so just as we don't know how much randomness there is in, the, in our world, we also don't know how much randomness there is in CIV-5. So all these things make CIV-5, when you set the ground rules right, and I, th I, th I think the research monster has done a good job of setting up the ground rules in, in, a, in a sensible way. When you set the ground rules up correctly, you, you do sort of put the players, the observers of Civ 5 in a position of ignorance somewhat similar to the position of ignorance that real-world analysts are in. The big difference is that in Civ 5, you know what the ground truth is. You know what, the, what, what happens in the what-if worlds. We don't, know, we don't get to see that until they give us the feedback on whether we're right or wrong. Yeah, do, do the forecasters get to see the, the entire game board or just like just, just the fraction of it that one player would be able to see? They get to see the entire game board. Okay, interesting. Yeah. So it's a bit like, yeah, okay. So they've got access to kind of cable news. They've got access to yes, satellite they, data. And the whole thing has been, is, is the whole thing is complete when they see it. Oh. They're, 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 they, see, they see the game, you know, it's all, it's all there to be read and you can, you can see uh, from turn zero to 500 or yeah. Um, Let's move on from the from the Civ Five uh, competition. Though hopefully there'll, there'll be some Civ Five addicts out there who can get in touch. And I potentially really, participate. I, I really hope there's. Um, it, it, it's 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 a serious cognitive challenge. It's an it's it, it it it's something I don't think anybody has ever done before. Um, trying to improve counterfactual reasoning in a simulation in the hope that we can make that stick later on in the real world. Yeah, I think I think listeners here have pretty high demand for cognition, so uh, might might be well suited to it. If you know Civ 5 really well and you're interested in spending many hours seriously testing your subjective probability forecasting skills, you can fill out a sign-up form which you can get to at 80k.link slash civ. That's 80k.link slash civ. We'll also link to that in the show notes and the associated blog posts, of course. All right, back to the interview. When we uh, last spoke about 18 months ago, you were just launching um, this uh, hybrid forecasting competition, uh, which I think aimed, aimed to pair uh, algorithms with human forecasters and, and see, see how well they did. And you were looking for people to, to participate. How, how is that one going? Is, are there kind of any early achievements or, or findings coming out of that research? Oh, well, that wasn't my competition. That was, a, that was an exercise that I was helping IARPA to recruit people for. And uh, I, I, know, I know that there are, there are some interesting results. I, I'm not sure how much IARPA wants those to be talked about right now. So I, 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 sh I should be careful. I, I, I would simply say that uh, I think it's been very difficult for algorithms to get a lot of traction on the kinds of questions that IARPA is interested in asking about. So if you're talking about using, now, now we are talking about using machine learning, uh, and, and how, what, what, what are the types of questions in the real world where machine learning becomes useful, and what are the types of questions where it flounders? And, and the short answer is, of course, the, the more data-rich the world, the more likely machine learning is to get traction. So if we're trying to predict um, macroeconomic statistics for OECD countries, you know, we have long time series. We can look at how the, how the variables change over time. We can also look at how the time series are intercorrelated with each other. We can see what the lags are. We can do create complicated econometric models. Uh, you can do a lot of interesting things, and machine learning might might be able to get some traction, reasonable traction vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, human forecasters there. But if you're talking about trying to predict the outcome of the Syrian civil war, or indeed, you know, relations with China and the South China Sea, or with the North state of negotiations with North Korea, or the U.S.-China trade war, uh, or the state of the Eurozone, or Brexit, the, the, all these things, people, uh, m the machine learning people, I think quite rightly, uh, kind of roll their eyes a bit, and they say, uh, you know, we don't have enough training data to make sense. Yeah, exactly. The base rates are elusive. The covariation structures are, are elusive. So 
it's hard for us to even get started. Now, of course, those questions are also very hard for humans. I'm not, <laughs> they, they may be impossible, impossible for, for machine learning and very hard for humans, but, um, but humans are able to do, I think, significantly better than zero, which suggests that the, the jobs of certain categories of human beings may be secure for a bit longer. It may be that you know, if you're a loan officer in a bank, your, your usefulness is, is highly questionable in a machine learning world. Whereas um, the CIA operatives, uh, the geopolitical analysts, they might they might have a longer future. Now, of course, if loan officers and banks are, are are serving another kind of function, if they're serving a political function, they're supposed to be sending giving money to friends and doing this or that. You, they, you <laughs> <laughs> then the loan officers can 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 rest secure. Uh, but if they're playing a pure um, you know uh, profit maximization game or accuracy maximization game, then um, maybe not. Yeah. Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll return to the to the algorithms a, a little bit later on. I'm, I'm keen to keen to learn more about how that, how they've done in your in your research. Yeah, as I was prepping for the, for this interview, I was looking uh, back over um, some some of your work, and, and and a point that I think had stuck with me over the years was this observation that people seem to kind of have only three probability settings, or like people who haven't been exposed to forecasting and probabilistic reasoning. They kind of think things either have zero percent probability, they definitely won't happen, or they have kind of a fifty percent probability they, they, they they might happen, but we don't know, or they're one hundred percent likely and they're definitely going to happen. Is is that uh, is this a kind of a general finding that like many people kind of reason in that way? They they flip between these three different uh, likelihoods. Yeah, it it's, uh, was, was a joke that I, 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 I first heard from Amos Tversky in the 1980s that people could only do that, but it was a joke. It wasn't intended to be a description of a serious research finding, but it is a stylized fact <laughs> that people have a hard time making subtle distinctions in the maybe zone. And they do gravitate toward yes and no and, and certainty, um, where we're, we're, we're ambiguity averse uh, and we have a hard time making subtle distinctions along probability continuums. So I think that's, I think that's fair. Uh, and I think that the best forecasters are able to resist that. Uh, and they're characterized by a capacity to make many more than three degrees of distinction among uncertainty. Uh, the best forecasters in a paper, Jeffrey Friedman and Richard Zeckhauser and Barbara Mellers and others did. Um, I was part of that team. The, 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 the best forecasters we find are able to make well, between 10 and 15 distinguish between 10 and 15 degrees of uncertainty for the types of questions that IARP is asking about uh, in these tournaments, like whether Brexit's going to occur or Greece is going to leave the Eurozone or what Russia is going to do in the Crimea, those sorts of things. Uh, now, th that's really interesting because a lot of people, when they look at those questions, say, well, you can't make probability judgments at all about that sort of thing because they, they're, they're, they're unique. And I, I think that's probably the most, one of the most interesting results of, of, of the work over the last 10 years. I mean, you, you, you take that objection, which you hear repeatedly from extremely smart people, that these events are unique and you can't put probabilities on them. You take that objection and you say, okay, let's take all the events that the smart people say are unique and let's put them in a set. And let's call that set allegedly unique events. Now, let's see if people can make forecasts <laughs> within that set of allegedly unique events. And if they can, if they can make meaningful probability judgments of these allegedly unique events, Maybe the allegedly unique events aren't so unique after all. Maybe there is some, there is some recurrence component. And that is indeed the finding, that it, it, when you take the set of allegedly unique events, uh, hundreds of allegedly unique events, you find that um, the best forecasters make uh, pretty well calibrated forecasts um, for fairly reliably over time and don't regress too much toward the mean. When I was reading the stylized fact of like, yeah, people think, people are like drawn to think that it's either 0%, 50% likely or 100% likely. I was wondering whether uh, that tendency might be able to explain some kind of weird behavior that, that, that I observe in people. So, so one is that it, seem, it seems quite common for people to kind of uh, have a like relatively uninformed view about something, but become like extremely confident about their kind of uh, split, or, like, their, 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 their quick judgments about it. Even though like if they really uh, sat there and thought about it, they'd realize that there's so much that they don't know, which kind of seems like they encounter some evidence that gets them to 80% or 90% likely uh, or like 90% confidence. And then they just kind of push it up to 100 because they can't be bothered thinking about this anymore. And then you've got the, yeah, these people who are like very underconfident about the ability to like draw d d distinctions between like 40% likely and 60% likely who kind of get stuck in this like maybes and they're like well it's un unknowable it's like it might happen it might not happen and, and, and they kind of miss out on the opportunity to like draw these like more, more sort of distinctions between likelihood. Exactly and and I mean take, take, a, take an issue that is, is, is politically polarizing in the United States uh, climate uh, change and, and, and forecasts of how, how rapidly the, the climate is changing as a function of uh, greenhouse gases and perhaps other factors, would I be considered to be a climate 
am I a believer in climate change or am I a disbeliever, a denialist, in, as it were? If I say to you, um, well, when I think about the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change forecast for the year 2100, their global surface temperature forecasts, uh, I'm about 70%, 72% confident that uh, they're within plus or minus 0 0.3 degrees centigrade uh, in their projections. Uh, and you kind of look at me and say, well, that's kind of precise and odd. But, you know, I've just acknowledged I think there's a 28% chance they could be wrong. Now, it could, it could be wrong on the upside or the downside, but I've, let's say it's the, the error, error bar is, 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 is symmetric. So I'm a 14% chance that they could be underestimating. <laughs> could, yeah. could, could, could be overestimated. Oh, overestimated, yeah. Uh, as, as, well as, <laughs> as, as well as underestimate. But yeah. so I'm, I'm flirting with the idea that they might be wrong, right? So, if you're living in a polarized political world in which expressions of political views are symbols of tribal identification, they're not, they're not statements of, oh, this is my best faith effort to understand the world. I've, I've thought about this, and I've read these reports, and I've looked at, I'm not a climate expert, but here's my best guesstimate. And if I, if I went to all the work of doing that, and by the way, I haven't. <laughs> I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm just a, this is a hypothetical person. I don't have the cognitive energy to do this. <laughs> but if someone had gone to all the cognitive energy of, of reading all these reports and trying to get up to speed on it and concluded, you know, say 72%, what would the reward be? They wouldn't really belong in any camp, would they? The climate proponents would, would kind of roll their eyes and say, you know, get, get on board. You're, you're slowing down the momentum for the cause by, rate, you know, by, giving, by giving sucker and, and some emotional support to the denialists. And the, the, the denialists will say, well, you're kind of suckered by the, by the believers. Uh, you're, you're not, you're not going to please anybody very much. You're not going to have, an, you're not gonna have a community of co-believers with whom you can comfortably talk about climate change in the bar. <laughs> you're, you're, you're going to be weird. You're going to be an outlier. You might be able to cobble together kind of four economists or something to, right. to have a beer with. <laughs> <laughs> there could be something like that, but there, there's, not, there's not a good intellectual home for you. And, and if you think that the major function of your beliefs is to help you fit into the social world. It's not to help you make sense of the world itself. Then uh, why, why go to all the bother of participating in forecasting tournaments? And I think that's one of the key reasons why forecasting tournaments are hard sell. I think people forecast do not just serve an accuracy function. People aren't just interested in accuracy. They're interested in um, uh, they're interested in fitting in. They're, they want to avoid embarrassment. They want to fit. They, they 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 don't they don't want their friends to call them names. Yeah, I don't want to be called. You know, I don't want to be called a denial denialist or a racist or whatever, whatever other kind of thing I might be, whatever the epithet you might incur by being assigning a probability on the wrong side of maybe. Speaking of climate change, like often when I go into the media, kind of every week it seems like there's like new, uh, like wild predictions being made about like how bad a climate change could be, uh, which I guess like sometimes sounds suspect to me. But you know, I'm not a like I'm not a climate scientist, and I don't really have time uh, in my day to day like work to to look into you know, how how scientifically grounded these forecasts are. Yeah, I guess you might encounter these forecasts as well, and there's, there's also people who claim that it's not going to be a problem at all. Uh, how do you kind of disentangle uh, like a problem like that in in, in real life? Well, the first, you know, one of the things I've learned to do over all this work is never pretend to be a subject matter expert in anything my people are forecasting on. Yeah. So I'm not an expert on North Korea. I'm not an expert on the euro. I'm not an expert on Colombian narco-terrorism <laughs> <laughs> or Syrian civil war. And I'm not an expert on the climate either. Now, I, I think there is an issue of people uh, feeling, that, especially on, on the climate activist side, that... They, the only way for them to build up political momentum for getting people to make sacrifices in the long term is to make, get them to believe that things are going to hell in a handbasket right now yeah. and that the floods and tornadoes and hurricanes and whatnot are unprecedented. Uh, I know that there are other people who say, oh, that don't look so unprecedented to us. And, and, that, and, that's, a, and that's a debate that's completely apart from the, 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 the larger question of, of, of warming. The, the long-term warming trend is a function of greenhouse gases. Uh, it, there's a question of, well, how rapidly would, would hurricanes increase? Or have hurricanes increased at all over the last 150 years? I don't know what the answer to that is. I know that uh, there are people who disagree about it. It's really important. For, I think I'm a process guy. I, I don't. If I, I, I don't want to have too. I don't want to have too many opinions. No. It's not useful for me to have too many so opinions. Like, yeah. Why? Why? Who would care what my opinion on this is? <laughs> no, so I guess why I'm should not. anyone care what my opinion is? <laughs> maybe, maybe I, I, but I, I, I do know that there are incentives for people yeah. to exaggerate. Right. And that happens over and over. 
And that happened, and you're much more likely to exaggerate when you're not in a forecasting tournament, you're not playing an accuracy. When you're playing a political power maximization media exposure game, exaggeration is the way to go. If you're in a forecasting tournament and you play that way, you're going to get creamed. Yeah, I guess I wasn't so much asking about climate change specifically, but I suppose I guess maybe I have a rule of thumb that when I like when advocates on a topic are speaking, that I'm like a lot more cautious about believing anything that they say. And I suppose that's like true of climate change, it's true of like many different issues that it can be like. It could, but but that means it means that they could be right. And I just like it's very hard for me to figure out. Like it means that I could make some big mistakes potentially. Uh, I think exaggeration adds to the noise, and I think it's probably short-sighted for advocates for activists to exaggerate. Um, I but I understand the temptation. Yeah, I think this, this is interesting to me, there's kind of a growing number of issues, or maybe it's always been this way, uh, where it's like b- believing that something is absolutely certain or absolutely uh, can't be true is uh, like a shibboleth uh, for, for, for participating in a particular particular group. And kind of yeah, anyone who expresses doubt is, uh, is, is liable to be, to, to be condemned. Anyone who's just like, well, I'm not quite sure about something, that's kind of not an acceptable view. Right. And in a sense, forecasting tournaments are almost the opposite of that. I mean, forecasting tournaments, you, know, you, you, if you, you, you put a probability of one on something and it doesn't happen. You, you, your credibility gets hit hard, uh, or probability of zero. When it does happen, your credibility gets hard. You, if you if you had been more more moderate, you 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 would you would you would, you would take a much much lower hit. So forecasting tournaments incentivize people to do something that is not altogether cognitively natural, and that is put a priority on accuracy, accuracy, and only accuracy. Uh, and you really don't care about whether you're. Um, Political loyalties, um, or, what, what, know, what, 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 the forming politi- the right alliances, what, what, whatever, the, however the chips may fall, it's just about accuracy. And in in principle, you know, there are government agencies that are supposed to do that, right? There's the Congressional Budget Office is is supposed to be an absolute straight shooter, nonpartisan. Uh, the intelligence community is supposed to be nonpartisan, straight shooter, just the facts, ma'am. There are lots of bodies. Um, the courts yeah. <laughs> are supposed to be. There are, lot, there are lots of bodies that are charged with me, uh, serving a purely epistemic function. And it's extremely difficult. Uh, and uh, and you, you, their, their, their credibility is often called into account. Just, just carrying on with this with uh, this idea of people kind of rounding to 100% or, or 0%, I'm particularly interested in kind of risk risk management, uh, like yeah, global catastrophic risks and, and trying to prevent them. And I guess I often see, encounter people who like kind of think that a risk is unlikely and then I, then I feel – and then they're like, so I, I don't think it's worth working on at all or at least I'm not worried about it at all. And it seems in those cases they're kind of rounding down from like a 1% probability to a 0% probability for, for whatever reason uh, that, that I'm not quite sure about. And so they miss that something – if something is really significant, then even if it's only 1% likely, uh, it, it could nonetheless be like uh, something that, that deserves a lot of attention. And I think another thing that people miss when they do this rounding uh, down to 0% is that they miss that something that's like 3% likely is like three times, might deserve three times as much attention as something that's 1% likely. And something that's 1% likely might deserve three, uh, 10 times as much attention as something that's like well, 0.1% likely. Uh, and yeah, it's just like not having like these fine gradients of probability, I think, uh, can, can lead to like really, really big misjudgments on, on some of the issues that I, that I care a lot about. Yeah, I, I, I think that's right. And I, I think that in the original Kahneman Tversky prospect theory paper, I think the original was 1979, I think they have an interesting line in there about how the probability weighting function in prospect theory is ill defined at the extremes, which means that people are going to do one of two things. They're either going to ignore very small probabilities or they're going to dramatically overweight them. <laughs> and, yeah. and they're going to oscillate between those two mistakes. They're not, it's not as though they're, they're, they're going to have a very hard time getting it right. Uh, that when, when they, uh, low, the low risk thing is very salient, uh, you, yeah. you know where it's going. And when it's not that salient, goodbye. <laughs> yeah, it seems like one of, it's one of the areas where it's hardest for humans to act rationally and, and hardest to coordinate to act rationally. Because kind of particularly gripping things like terrorism like really uh, like, yeah, are so salient that they get a lot of attention. And there can be like other really big risks that people just don't think about. And so they, they get neglected a lot. And it's like things that are like 40% likely or 60% likely, kind of people through experience, I guess, like learn how, how, how often they happen. But things that are like out in the tails, it's just so hard as a society to kind of appropriately apportion our, our, our attention to those things. Well, one of the great challenges here is, 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 is extending assessments of accuracy to low probability events. Because when you're, as 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 the events descend into very low probabilities, they might you might expect them to occur only once every three or four hundred thousand years, <laughs> and then that, that that requires a lot of patience from the research sponsors. Uh, to, um, <laughs> So the question is, if you if you don't have accuracy criteria for these some of these extreme tail risk sorts of events, what metrics do you have aside from you know faith or resort to the precautionary principle or something yeah. of that sort? Well, I mean, you could just like try to make form an inside view. Just just try to have good understanding of the world and try to assess the probability, which is difficult. But I think not 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 you can do better than random. Well, you, here's what one thing you can do. Well, 
you can create categories of risk that have higher probability, and you can assess you know, the, those categories. You can decompose the categories, and you can see how logically consistent people are with the judgments of sets and subsets. Uh, so, you know, if you think you know, your likelihood of dying in a car accident is greater than your likelihood of dying of all other co- of, 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 of a car accident and all other causes, <laughs> you know, we, we know that you're, you're, there's, there's something wrong with your probability judgments, even though we have no idea what, whether you got the probability right or, or wrong. So you're, there are logical consistency checks on, on probabilities at the extreme range that can be implemented, and I think would, it, it is useful to implement. Let's turn to something a little bit more more prosaic, uh, which is kind of forecasting in, in one's personal life or, or, or career. So because almost anyone who kind of uh, engages really seriously with 80,000 hours advice and, and tries to apply it to their life at some point has to kind of make some potentially very difficult forecasts about how things might pan out for them. So you, know, you can imagine someone who's just finishing their, their undergrad and they're trying to decide whether to, whether to start a PhD. They kind of will probably want to like forecast, you know, what's the odds of me actually finishing the PhD versus dropping out? And then if I, you know, I do do finish the PhD, like what are my odds of, of getting an academic position that's actually worthwhile? Like what's my probability of using it? Things like, you know, if I apply for a prestigious job in the civil service, uh, what's the likelihood that, I, that I'll get it? And, you know, if I start a start a business and I try to uh, make a lot of money to, to, to donate uh, by, by starting a business, what's the probability that this business will take off? And then, then like how big will it be? Like all of these things are uh, potentially very, very important, are very decision relevant, but, but, but quite hard to estimate. I was thinking possibly we could try to uh, run through how someone might uh, estimate the odds of successfully becoming an academic, uh, you know, as, as when they're finishing an undergraduate degree, uh, just because that's kind of potentially the, the career path that you're most familiar with as a, as, as a professor yourself. Is, is that something that you feel feel game to game to game to try? Sure, uh, <laughs> but 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 uh, it's going to come with a big caveat. Uh, I- these forecasting tournaments, we have people forecasting things over which they have no control. So they're, they're, they're strictly observers. They're, they're, it, it, that's true for the simulation worlds. And it's true in the real world, too. I mean, the forecasters are making forecasts about the Eurozone or North Korea or Sub-Saharan Africa. And, you know, it's about epidemics or financial panics or military clashes, whatever it is. Uh, they're, they're, they're making forecasts about things they don't control, that they're in the role of dispassionate observers. When you talk about making predictions about your behavior and the behavior of people with whom you're in frequent interaction, you know, your, your spouse and your coworkers and so forth, when you're doing that, you're no longer just a forecaster, you're a player. So there's a story I'm fond of, of um, that my, my co-author of Super Forecasting, Dan Gardner, told me about. It was, um, I think it was the, an, an NHL team uh, in Canada that was yeah, Ottawa Senators maybe who had fallen behind in in the uh, it was either the the run up to the Stanley Cup or the Stanley Cup the, the championship, they'd fallen behind three to one in the in the best of seven series, and some reporter runs up to the coach after they just lost the last game most recent game, and says, "Hey, coach, you think you got a chance?" And the coach says, he pauses, and he actually thinks about it. Fatal, fatal career mistake by this coach. <laughs> he pauses, and he thinks about it, you know. You know, probably, it's going to be, but probably not. <laughs> um, the coaches are not supposed to talk that way. They're supposed to say, of course we're going to win, because they need to infuse their team with enthusiasm. Uh, because they're not just making a probabilistic forecast. They're, it serves a different function. They're not playing an accuracy game now. They're playing a confidence infusion game. They're playing a political mobilization game or an action mobilization. Like the climate people, too. I mean, it's, 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 it's mobilization. It's not, it's not just about accuracy. So... There are all these games that people play, uh, you know, about how long is your marriage going to survive? And how, <laughs> does, does your athletic team have a chance? Are you gonna, is, your career, is your career in graduate school going to go into the basement? Yeah. And so there are these countless questions uh, that could either become self-negating or self-fulfilling prophecies in your life. Uh, and it's a, it's a matter of how you, as a human being, and with your values, you, may, you make decisions about um, what, what, what you are and are not going to believe, who you are or are not. And the forecasts are now existential statements about identity and who you are. I'm the kind of person who is really gritty, and I'm gonna I'm gonna make I'm gonna make this work against the I'm gonna overcome the odds. I transform the odds. I'm not a I don't or and I put it a little bit differently. Uh, I, I I'm gonna make history. I'm not gonna. I'm not forecasting. I'm a maker of history. And it, it, Karl Marx had, a, had an amusing line also to that effect. That he, he said, that the purpose you know, of my work is not to understand the world, it's to change it, to change it. 
So I think it prob- probably does pay to be a bit optimistic that the that the plans you're making are, are, are going to work out. But perhaps before before you decide what the plan is uh, is going to be, <laughs> I guess you're in this difficult spot where you're like you want to do kind of dispassionate forecasting of the like of the merits of different options before you go into them. And then once you commit to one, then you just like you're, you're all in potentially and like or at least you're like somewhat overconfident about how it's going to pan out. Uh, so that because that will just drive you forward. Yeah, and I guess convince other people to to, to to join you as well. I think that's very useful distinction, and there there are some people who do work on that. Uh, and you know they say that you, there's a deliberation mindset. Where, where accuracy matters, and there's an implementation mindset when you just do it. And some organizations have a crisp distinction between deliberation and implementation. Militaries do, and org- businesses, and, and people, for that matter. I think, say, you know, there's a time to think, there's a time to act. Now, of course, the division isn't that simple, yeah. because at some point you have to re- reassess whether you made the right decision or not. Things disastrous. <laughs> yeah. So there's got to be some updating going on, unless you're a complete fanatic. If you never return to deliberation, you, you, you're only in implementation mode henceforth, you have slipped over into the domain of fanaticism. So, 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 so well, we'll come back to try to do the, do the forecast in just a second. This is a little diversion. But are you familiar with that free economics experiment uh, suggesting that people don't quit as quickly as they should? That uh, it, when, when they, they did a randomization experiment where they would flip a coin and encourage people uh, who got heads to, to, to quit whatever thing they were thinking about quitting and people got tails to not. And they found that the people who got, got heads and were told to quit uh, did actually quit more often and, and, and their lives went better. Or they reported that their welfare was higher three and six and maybe 12 months out. Mm-hmm. I guess is it, it might be possible to explain this by the, by the idea that, yeah, p- People realize that they have to kind of um, overcommit or become overconfident about whatever whatever track they're on, uh, which means that they're likely to kind of stick with it potentially a, a, a bit too long if it's going badly. Uh, if, if things are like going below expectations, they, they, they're going to be a little bit blind to that, uh, potentially deliberately. And so if they get kind of forced out of it uh, by, by something like a coin flip, then, uh, then then that is kind of beneficial. Although if they hadn't, uh, I guess if, if they'd never kind of been overconfident, then maybe things that they, they never would have had a sort of chance of, of making it through through something difficult. Well, Steve Levitt's a very clever guy. Uh, <laughs> and I, I think that's, a, I, I've heard about that result. I haven't read the experiment. It, it, it's intriguing. Yeah. All right. Let's let's go back to the uh, to the uh, becoming an academic example. We're, we'll probably uh, we'll use some probabilities here, but that's that's not so much the point as to as to try to like demonstrate uh, how you might go about like yeah what what, what procedure you might use for, for estimating the, the likelihood. So someone's someone's finishing undergrad. Like their ultimate goal is to become an academic who's doing really valuable research. And I guess there's there's multiple different kind of filters that they have to get through. They've got to get into a good PhD program probably at a, at a university that has a record ideally of kind of placing people. They've got they've got to finish the PhD. Then I don't know probably of getting a postdoc or probably of getting an, an academic position. And then like having done that, like what are the odds that they'll have kind of the, the freedom or the funding to do something that they actually think is useful for the world? Uh, do, do, do you have any thoughts on how someone might, might try to put this together to try to, to try to estimate whether it's, whether it's worth, worth setting out on this path to start with? Well, uh, it, 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 it's a tough racket. And uh, it obviously matters a lot what field you choose. So you know, your prospects are much better in computer science than they are in English hmm. or history. So do I have anything... More perceptive than that to say. <laughs> so, so I guess what we typically recommend that people do is uh, well, we'll start by looking at the base rate. Um, and those are base rates. Huh? Yeah. So, so kind of look at yeah how many PhD graduates. Yeah, we, we've like tr- tried to find these numbers for some fields. So it's actually surprisingly difficult to find nicely comparable data uh, across different disciplines. But uh, you look at like the number of PhDs that are being minted in these different fields each year. And then look at the number of like uh, yeah actual academics uh, jo- jobs like maybe in total or that are that are opening up or positions that become available each each year and kind of look at that ratio and very often it's like a few percent potentially so like you can you can expect that only a relatively small fraction of the PhD grads are at least getting like actually you know tenured or like research research focused academic positions so that I guess so you you kind of always recommend starting with kind of the outside view or the, or, or base rates at least usually doing that uh, do, do you agree that that's kind of probably the way to go in this case as well Yes, I do. Graduate school is a risky life move. It's academic life it can be very rewarding, but it, 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 it's, a, it's a hard line of work to break into. And the way the academic labor market has become stratified with adjuncts, for example, I think that's made it harder. I, I think there are fields in which there is robust demand still in, in STEM disciplines, but uh, elsewhere it's increasingly a long shot. So I guess I think it's actually not entirely obvious that you always want to start with with the base rate, or at least not for such a broad reference class, because there's this possibility that, and I think this probably is the case in some fields, that almost all of the probability is going to like a relatively small fraction of PhD students or, or PhD graduates. So there's some fields, I guess, like economics, which seem like very top heavy, at least that's one that I'm kind of familiar with, where like if you're not at one of the top 10 or 20 economics programs, then, then your probability of getting like a research-focused economics position uh, drops pretty precipitously. 
And so you can potentially get misled by, by starting with a base rate that's like looking at so, so big picture. I think uh, there's also been um, some calls among people I know for, for organizations in the effective altruism space to, to publish the number of position, people who were hired versus the number of applications they got uh, for, for a job uh, to try to help people to, inf- to, to, like, to decide whether to go through the effort of actually applying for jobs. And I do worry there that sometimes just giving such a broad base rate could be misleading because the reality is for like, you know, half of the applicants, they're probably getting the job is kind of close to zero. And for like some other people, they're probably getting the job might be, you know, really, really quite high. And just giving this uh, thing of like, well, on average, it was 1% likelihood of getting hired uh, could uh, like, yeah, lead, lead people astray. Absolutely. Um, picking the right base rate is a very valuable forecasting skill and life skill. Uh, and uh you, you, you know a lot more about yourself than, than, the, than the base rate. Uh, and you know a lot more about yourself even than your, uh, your, your, your GRE scores or your, um, your, your undergrad institution. So yes, you're, you're going to update in response to that, to that information. Um, you know, you know, and then once you've gone, been in graduate school, you know about how much you published. And you, most people in grad school, I think, have a fairly good sense for where they rank. I don't think there are very many grad programs that actually rank order their students. Where the, you know, the department faculty get together and say, these are the five people we really want to push this year. But I think there probably is rough agreement often in departments about who the most likely to be hired people are. And there are surprises, but I, I, I'm, I'm going to think that there are Maybe I'm an overconfident faculty member here, but I, 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 I'm, 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 I'm going to guess they can do very substantially better than chance. Yeah. I think when people try to narrow down from such a broad base rate, though, um, they are in a little bit of a bind because you're saying that, in a sense, you know a lot more about yourself than the base rate does uh, or than like other people do. But there's another sense in which it can be like very hard to judge your own abilities because I just find... That's, some also, people, that's also true. Yeah. <laughs> it's like it can always be like hardest to look yourself in the mirror because... Uh, well, one thing is you see yourself from a different perspective than you see other people. And there's like all yeah. these biases that could be like, I just know so many people who seem like both extraordinarily overconfident and extraordinarily underconfident about their own abilities. Yeah, um, that's, that's, a, that's a very interesting question of how accurate are self-perceptions. A lot of the literature does indeed focus on on, on biases uh, like uh, over-optimism about, or an overconfidence and, and also even defensive pessimism and, and underestimating. So it's it's a very interesting question of how exactly how accurate people are. I'm I'm going to wager, and I I don't know uh, the facts on this, but I'm going to bet that uh, people are moderately accurate o- on average. Yeah, okay, yeah. moderately. So which which means I think that it's it's, very, it's useful information to add in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, let me put it this way. <laughs> Another way to put it: if, if you if you really are delusional, your 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 chances of success in this domain are extremely small. <laughs> yeah, this has been this has been a really difficult area to to, to know exactly what to recommend that people do. I, I guess it seems like probably the best shot you might get is if you can kind of get close to a mentor or like someone who's already in the field who can like get to know your abilities relatively well. And then if you can somehow get them to like give you a really frank assessment of, of, of what your odds are, that might be among like the best, the best forecast that, you, that you're likely to get. If, if you know, you do like a research, you do a research project with, a, with an academic as an undergrad, and then they can like give you some sense of like wh- whether you potentially have what it takes. Um, I mean, even there, it's, like, it's going to be very difficult because you're potentially young, like maybe you'd mature during the PhD. And, and, and of course, like people hate to break people bad news. So, so I, I think in some fields, there is a bit of a habit of, I think, academics like leading people on uh, saying, oh, yeah, go do the PhD uh, because... Well, one, it's like it's nice to have students under you who can who can do some of the grunt work as PhD uh, students. Uh, so it's like, yeah, there's a bit of a selfish motivation there. But also, just um, you you want to be positive to people and you want to like um, you know encourage them. Uh, so you kind of have to wonder. Like, yeah, you always have to like kind of judge are people like telling it to you straight. What an interesting idea of. Um, I mean, fa- faculty do owe that to students to give to give them candid feedback. But on the other hand, they don't want to demoralize people, and it, it, graduate students are. Somewhat easy to demoralize something. Yeah, it's 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 hard on your mental <laughs> um, health because the feedback is it, often it, so weak. It it, it it is so it's it's a very difficult problem. Um, but you it's, it's saying establish a social contract with a faculty member whose judgment you really trust, or even better yet, two faculty members whose judgment you really trust, and 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 say to them, look, I I, I know there's a non non zero chance that I, I'm going to work. Ext- I'm, I'm going to do my best. I'm really I'm going to do my best on this project and. If if you conclude at the end of this that you know your best, you're 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 pessimistic about your, your prognosis is somewhat grim. I, I'd I'd really I really would appreciate. It. I'd be grateful for the rest of my life if you just give me that honest honest feedback. That that's an interesting. I've, I've never no one's ever approached me like that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, 
But it's an interesting thought experiment. It reminds me of an, an old joke about Henry Kissinger and Alexander Haig, um, who was um, kind of an underperforming underling at one point under, under Kinder Kissinger. And he would, he would deliver a report to Kissinger, and um, he, he, the next day he'd come back and he'd say, what did you think, Mr. Secretary? And, and, he, and Kissinger would look at it and he'd, at his desk and he'd throw it back at him and he'd do it again. <laughs> and yeah. he'd come back the next time and he'd do the cycle a few, two or three times, do it again, do it again. Finally, he'd come in and say, I've done my absolute best. I can't do it any better. He said, okay, I might look at it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I hadn't heard that one. That's an interesting uh, approach to teaching. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's a bit disappointing if people aren't even coming to you for an honest forecast about things. You think that they, they, they might at least try that. I guess, I guess another approach that people can take is rather than look at the very broad base rate, like, or like someone's kind of qualitative judgment based on knowing them, uh, try to get like quantitative data, which in some fields is more available than others. But you can kind of you know, look at your GRE scores, look at your grade point average, look at, look at your SATs, yeah. and then maybe look at like, what's the typical, you know, entry uh, GRE for people entering this field? What's the typical GRE for people who like eventually got jobs uh, in that field, if you can potentially find, find data on that? I guess that, that has the disadvantage that uh, sometimes those quantitative measures can be a little bit crude and can throw out like important, important information. But on the other hand, it means that it's a little bit harder to kind of delude yourself uh, based on, yeah, feeling that feeling that you're special. Uh, like it, is a, it has a little bit, 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 bit more firmness to it. And also you might possibly be able to find some actual data on what were the, what were the scores that, uh, that, that academics actually got. Yeah, so that's a very interesting question. I don't know what the, exactly the data are on this, but you know, most people who get, make, make the cut into, into elite graduate programs have pretty high test scores and, and they, 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 they have you know, in, intelligence test scores that are comparably high because the two really are very closely related. Mm-hmm. And so let's say the average IQ of um, you know, students at an elite school, an elite program is you know, 125 or 130. How much of an advantage would it be if yours was 150 or 160 or you, you, you had 800, 800, 800 GREs? I don't know how that translates onto a scale, but I'm not even sure how common 800, 800, 800 are now. And it used to be quite uncommon, but they may be more common now. How much of a, how much of a performance boost do you get? Is, is, how much of a difference is there in the career effectiveness of lawyers or doctors or professors who have IQs of 130 versus 160? And how much is really driven by character as opposed to intelligence at a certain point? I've heard experts, psychometricians, argue this out. And, and I, 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 there's one school that says there actually is a difference between 130 and 160. Yeah. And there's another one that says it's almost totally driven by character. I don't know who's right, uh, but it is an interesting debate. Yeah, I've seen one paper on this looking at research output uh, and correlating that with like yeah IQs really out in the tables which suggested that uh, yeah IQ did predict uh, research output and, and discoveries uh, um, so I, I can I can dig that up and try to find it I haven't I haven't scrutinized it terribly much there's, so. a, there's a there's a professor in the UK you may know uh, Stuart Ritchie yeah, yeah yeah I think he he might he might he probably knows he probably knows the answer I mean, on, on this um, yeah mm-hmm. I've, I've never gotten an IQ test because I feel like uh, either I would end up being really smug or I'd end up feeling uh, disappointed in myself. And, and then I'm, I'm also not sure, like, I feel like I'd end up disappointed if I did badly, but I'm not sure that I would have learned anything really that useful about myself either that I didn't already know. It's like, I already kind of know what I'm accomplishing and what I'm not. So. Well, I can, ass- <laughs> I can assure you people my age should not be taking okay. tests like that. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. there's a fairly well-known pattern that, you know, that, 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 that fluid intelligence peaks around 25 or 30. And now crystallized can continue to increase up, up to, even, even up to my age um, and, and, until, memory loss starts to yeah. <laughs> take its inevitable toll. But yeah. I, I, I think it's a losing game for people over 50. Yeah, I guess <laughs> and, I, and, I'm, and I'm considerably over 50. So. I'm over the hump, so it's too, too late for me to do an IQ test now. <laughs> another, another case that, that comes up a lot is people trying to predict the uh, like likelihood of their businesses succeeding. We're in San Francisco, lots of people doing startups, uh, trying, trying to figure out, is their business idea any good? Do you have any, any experience or like, have you seen any research on whether people can predict that and maybe how they can do a better job of it? Well, it's the same base rate problem, yeah. right? Because most, most, most startups fail. And it depends on how exactly you define the base rate. I mean, uh, if you, uh, what, 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 pop, what population of, of, of small businesses, so if they're businesses that are able to attract VC funding in Silicon Valley, if they're able to pass that initial screen, they're much better than, you know, some person who just decides to set up a restaurant randomly in a neighborhood. But even then, even after they pass VC screening, uh, I think the base rates are pretty low. Now, yeah. I, I bet them, I suspect the VCs like to keep these data pretty <laughs> confidential, mm. but I, I, would, I would be surprised if um, there were any shops that were able to achieve, uh, you know, one in three hit rate. Another practical approach that, that one might take uh, with yeah, businesses and, and academic careers uh, 
in as much as you somewhat despair of like figuring out whether your, your odds are like 3% or 6% because it's just, just too hard is to find something that has kind of fat tail distribution of outcomes, something where like if it goes well, it will go really well and, and you'll have an enormous impact. Sure, absolutely. And then, yeah. yeah, and then like find one that's plausible or find one that's like appealing out of that and then pursue it until you get evidence that in fact it's like not panning out, that you're not going to end up out in the tail and then like try to find another thing that has like a fat tail distribution then give that one a crack. Uh, right, yeah, and, 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 that, and that's why many, uh, a number of VCs are, uh, have quite low thresholds for funding yeah. um, and uh, in, in the hope of getting the next Facebook or Google, they, they, they can afford many, many dozens, many hundreds, many thousands of misses <laughs> and, 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 and still do magnificently. Yeah. Now, obviously, they still have to balance false positives and false negatives, and they're still aspiring to accuracy. But when, 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 you, when you think that there, are, there, there is um, a fat tail of um, extremely lucrative possibilities out there, you, you, you really don't want to miss them, and you're willing to tolerate a lot of false positives in the quest. I guess it's a little bit more challenging for an individual uh, person who's just finished their undergraduate degree because maybe they get they're thinking, oh, do I want to go into government or do I want to become an academic or maybe I want to go into go into business or yeah, start a nonprofit? It's like maybe they only get kind of three of those before they're, they're starting to get you know hit their mid thirties and perhaps they're like not willing to be as adventurous as, as they used to be. And like if all three of them don't pan out, then uh, then I guess they have to have a backup option that seems a little bit safer that that they can potentially move into unless they're they're very adventurous. Yeah. Well, there's the human life cycle and you know, <laughs> there's the desire to reproduce and all all sorts of things that kick in. And- yeah. Ob- obligations to other people uh, people yeah. find themselves locked into things they didn't expect to be locked into yeah but i guess if you yeah if you choose three kind of upside yeah options with a lot of upside then i guess you're giving yourself a decent chance and uh yeah as long as you have like something to something to back into later then uh, probably you have a pretty good life yeah you know this is an interesting sequencing strategy i have to confess you know that i i, I guess i wasn't as, as, as that creative in my my life i i i i found, i found academia a pretty comfortable place very early on and I, I didn't really start to make serious contact with the real world until I was in middle age, and the world the world started to pay some degree of attention to what I was doing. Uh, but otherwise, I would have just been <laughs> completely in academia. <laughs> yeah. Pushing on to it to a slightly different topic related to people and improving their ability to, to predict what's going to happen in their life and uh, making good decisions. To go along with releasing this episode, we're actually going to put up on our site this um, calibration training tool that was developed or funded by the, by the Open Philanthropy Project, uh, which people can get to at 80,000hours.org slash calibration hyphen training. Uh, and just to remind everyone, uh, c- calibration is the um, ability to uh, tell that like when something feels like it's 90% likely, it does actually happen nine times out of 10. And when something feels like it's 20% likely, it does happen two times out of 10. So it's kind of one, one of the two measures of uh, good forecasting ability. The other one being like being able to get away from the 50-50 probability towards like actually making strong claims about things that definitely will and definitely won't happen. A very important component. Yeah. <laughs> the other very important component. <laughs> that's, um, that second component is not to be understated. <laughs> I would say yeah. resolution is every bit as important as calibration. Yeah, and, definitely. Some people might say more. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, have you seen this tool or kind of uh, any, any other tools? I'm familiar, like it? I'm familiar with it, and yeah. I think Michael Mabasan has created something somewhat similar. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, and, and and good, good judgment. Uh, the, the, the the private sector spinoff from the Good Judgment Project, Good Judgment Incorporated, I think has probabilistic reasoning training that that, that includes that as well. Yeah, I think they spent quite a few years uh, developing this one. I'm not sure how it compares to the others, but it's uh, got like different kinds of training. Like you got like confidence intervals. Uh, like I think political fact questions. People who are more more political. Uh, you can try to guess city populations, uh, the answers to math problems, and like the confidence on them. Uh, and I guess like various different kinds of correlations. Oh, wonderful! So it, 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 you see, so you can assess tra- transferability across domains. Yeah, so that, I think that's, that's like one of them. That, yeah. that, well, that's a really big thing because transfer has always been one of the, the most difficult challenges for psychologists designing training to overcome. Transfer statistics have tended to be disappointing. How valuable do you think doing this is? I mean, it seems like it's probably worth doing it for a couple of hours, but it's possible that because like the transfer between doing things like politifact questions or yeah, math problems or like correlations between different kind of social statistics is kind of, it might be weak with like the other kind of questions like you're trying, that you're trying to assess in life, like what's my chances of becoming an academic that uh, maybe, maybe you hit declining returns after a couple of hours. Oh, it could be turned into a, a useful research instrument, uh, potentially. Uh, it, I, I, would, I would be curious to know, for example, whether people who uh, have been randomly assigned to do this and have actually done it can generate more accurate conditional forecasts in Good Judgment Open or in, in sites like that. Has this ever been experimented with, uh, giving people calibration training and then seeing whether they do better in these tournaments? A little bit. The probabilistic reasoning training that we developed in the original tournaments was able to deliver performance boosts in forecasting uh, between 6 and 12% over each of the four years. 
Um, we called it Champs No, the training module. And there was a brief calibration exercise, but nothing as extensive as you're describing. And, you know, we described what calibration was. We emphasized its importance. We gave them some examples of how people can be miscalibrated um, and, and some practice questions. But we didn't, um, we didn't do it exhaustively. And we were, address we were addressing a lot of other points also, uh, like, like base rates and belief updating and information search, how to be a creative information seeker. Uh, so there were a lot of things that were in there. In a tournament, you know, we, 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 the priority is not on doing precise experimentation, it's on winning. So you take everything you think might work and you kind of put it all together and you kind of, it's like throwing the kitchen sink at it, right? You're, 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 it, so tournaments uh, really require careful follow-up experimentation. We try to triangulate in on exactly what worked because the investigators are typically doing a lot of things to, to win the race. So, I, but the short answer is, yeah, I think that I, it's not, I, I think people should look at it, and maybe there's some interesting uh, collaborative potential there. Yeah, I've, I've used it for a bit, and I felt like I was getting more calibrated over time, though. I was like reasonably good to start with. I'm not, that that might have just been luck, or I, I actually do in my day to day life, like assign probabilities to things just every hour, like every half hour, because it's just like how I think about about acting in life, and it's possible that that has has helped to calibrate me over the years. You're becoming a bookie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Oh, that's, that's, that's interesting. So, is there an interest? Here's another question, though. Are you measuring resolution? Are you giving feedback on resolution as well? Oh. If you're only giving feedback on calibration, is there a danger that. Um, we'll start like just pinning to 50 50 or. Well, not. That, that would be too extreme, mm -hmm. but. Yeah. Th there, there may be some implicit base rates lurking in there. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I might I, I, maybe maybe bring them uh, bring that up with uh, with the people who made it, uh, but but before we launch it, and, uh, yeah, see, see what they have to say about that. Yeah, I, I think giving them feedback on both calibration and resolution is 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 a, is a good idea because they are they're, they're you know in in real life when you look at them they're correlated with each other. People who are well calibrated also tend to get good resolution scores, and that's not too surprising. Almost has to be. It doesn't have to be, but it's it's almost has to be. But there is a degree of tension. There 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 are different styles. And there are some people, there are some managers, I think, who really value decisiveness in their employees and do look for extreme answers and, and really value that. And, and the more nuanced 30, 40, 50, 30, those, those people in the middle that will get, will get less recognition. It's an interesting problem. I mean, what, one of the things we looked at in, in the early work on expert political judgment was whether the well-calibrated forecasters were, well were, 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 were just being cowards. Right, so it rains 60% of the time in Seattle, so you always predict 60%, so you, you get a perfect calibration score. Whereas what you really want are people who say it's 95% chance of rain when it rains and a 5% chance when it, when it doesn't rain. And that, that gets you a great resolution score, as well as, well as being well calibrated, because you're, 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 you're right. Uh, but if you're, when you say 95% and it doesn't happen, you take a big hit. So that there, it's a trade-off in people's minds. I think if you tell people you're judging them for on both properties, it's going to force them to be more mentally agile, and they'll be making more trade-offs in their head. They'll say, "Oh, well, I, you know, I, I, I don't want to be overconfident. On the other hand, I don't want to be a chicken." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so one of, one of the critiques of my early work was what the fox when the fox the fox and more foxy forecasters are better than the hedgehoggy forecasters. Was oh well, you know, the foxes are just chickens. Well, was that the case? Uh, no, oh, no. Okay, well, <laughs> but we had, we had we had to address it statistically though. Okay, that's interesting. So, so yeah, so they weren't just being cowards. They were like, as you were saying, that like calibration and discrimination. Well, well, they were they were more moderate, but mm. but but they but they also did better on resolution. I see. So yeah. they 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 they, um, they didn't uh, buy calibration at a cost of de de degrading resolu resolution below that of the hedgehogs. So some friends of mine have been trying to produce kind of other uh, useful, ideally useful kind of training content for a broad audience to help to improve their like reasonableness and and the, and the forecasting ability. I think yeah, actually you might have met one of the, one or two of them uh, here at Air Global today. Do you have any ideas for like yeah, what the best opportunities are for producing kind of training content that people haven't haven't already seen, which like actually might you know allow people to to, to become more accurate at, at, at forecasting uh, within like a reasonable time frame? Well, we're hoping that the work we're doing now within Focus uh, on uh, helping people become more rigorous uh, lesson extractors from history uh, will 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 translate into improvements that haven't been observed before. That, that that's a promissory note, though. That's not something that we, we we can we can say we've demonstrated. I guess you're asking me beyond the the training protocol we developed in the ACE tournament, known as Champs No. Do we have anything new to report on the training side that works uh, and that delivers systematic, replicable improvements? Yeah, um, ideally. <laughs> and I, I I think we have some hints that something works 
but I don't think it's replicable yet. So okay. I'm going <laughs> to, since we're in the age of replication, <laughs> we'll that's, just say maybe <laughs> uh, stay tuned. Yeah, it's extremely noble of you. Uh, but it's, no. it's not easy. It's not easy to do this. There's like a cursing the darkness phase of my career and a lighting candles phase of my career. And the cursing the darkness phase of documenting the biases uh, that uh, other people blaze the trail on uh, was much easier than lighting candles. Yeah. Lighting, the, the improving judgment, I, I call it meliorism, you know, like a commitment to making things better, is, is, is really hard work and, and, and frustrating. Uh, the, the, the failure rate of studies is, has been uh, somewhat discouragingly high. So like in business school, people often do kind of case studies. Can you imagine kind of incorporating a prediction element into like where people like find out things about business situations in the past and then try to uh, figure out whether they succeeded or failed? Could you imagine that kind of kind of helping with people's ability to, yeah, like make good business decisions? Yes. I, I think that what we're doing now actually with Civ 5 could easily be adapted to many business simulations. So uh, the, 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 kind, the kind of training we're doing, the kind of learning that, that people are engaging in, is very similar. So you get you get one of these Harvard business cases. You know, if the CEO had done this rather than that, what would have happened? Now, if it's a depending on the kind of simulation it is, if, if it's a simulation of Intel or it's a simulation of an actual company, the answer is unknowable. We don't we don't actually know what what, the, what would have happened. Although we have we often have some reasonable hints because of the, the market is so is is a corrective force. At any rate, uh, it has promise. Yeah. Yeah, a friend of mine, Danny Hernandez, made, made this interesting point that uh, we would kind of like to be able to figure out who super forecasters are uh, really easily and quickly and cheaply uh, because then we could yeah, give, give more weight to their judgment. But as it is, like using, using normal uh, tournaments, it takes like quite a while, both, both work for them and like a t- time, time to pass in the world uh, before you can figure out whether someone is a super forecaster. Did, did you imagine that just like say measuring someone's performance on a calibration test could give like some indication of whether they, whether they might be a super forecaster or not? It might, yes. Uh, although I'd want resolution as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the, the the idea of being able to screen people much more rapidly than waiting for you know two years of tournaments and seeing who regresses toward the mean, <laughs> uh, I, I understand the appeal of that. That 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 would, that would be a faster way of identifying talent. Cool. And 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 I, I it it may be it may be feasible. I I, I think it's certainly worth trying. Yeah, maybe someone out in the audience can, can try to adapt to one of these tools uh, to, to, I, I think to, to it's that a, purpose. I, I think it's a very reason. You know, businesses are somewhat constrained by their human resources departments and their legal departments and the kinds of studies they're allowed to perform on their employees and the kinds of criteria they're allowed to use in screening employees. So, you know, they have, they have to validate tests that are used for employment and things like that. So it's, not a, it's a non-trivial matter for a business to adopt. You know, I, I say kind of glibly when I, I talk about, you know, how, 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 to, how the earlier forecasting tournaments were won. You know, step one is get the right people on the bus. <laughs> um, and, that, and that sounds easy, but it's not. Yeah. It, 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 took, it took a long time to figure out who the right people were. And an organization or a business thinking of doing this would, would, would probably be well advised to talk to its legal department first. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, that, yeah, maybe there's something that uh, individuals out there can, can have a go at. The, the, uh, the tool that I, that I mentioned, the calibration tool um, from Open Philanthropy Project, is written in this like, pretty easy programming language called Guided Track that was actually developed by um, Spencer Greenberg, who's also been a, been a guest on the show. So it's, it would be, would be relatively easy, potentially, to, to take some of that and, and modify it for, like, for related purposes, like uh, yeah, uh, measuring people's performance. That's, uh, that, that's very interesting. Okay, yeah. I, I would like to see that. So let's dive into some uh, more technical questions about kind of yeah, the forecasting research that they've done over the years. I've, uh, I asked online um, what, what questions people had, difficult questions that people will have come up with uh, when they've been reading, reading your, your books or your papers that, 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 they, that they're curious to get answers to. And actually, uh, the philosopher uh, Daniel uh, uh, Coco Tylo, I hope I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, wrote up this, this really beautiful summary of, uh, of the practical findings uh, from your work um, for an organization called uh, AI Impacts. Uh, we're just trying to kind of forecast progress in AI and try, try to figure out how that might, might affect society. And actually, I think if someone was only going to spend 20, 20 minutes reading about uh, forecasting and, and your work, uh, it's, it's, that's probably the, the link that I'd give them at this point. Uh, so, uh, so I'll definitely stick up a link to, to, to that piece in the, in the blog post uh, with, with the show notes. I'm, um, I'm curious already. Yeah, <laughs> I'll send it to you as well. Yeah, and I asked him for a couple of questions. And so, so a, few, a few of the gems in here, I think, uh, I down, down to Daniel. So, so thanks to him. Yeah, so, so he, he noted that uh, there's this page, or there, used to, there used to be this page on the Good Judgment Project's website that used to break down 
the kind of various different ways to, to, to get better forecasts. And it suggested you got kind of a 40% boost from talent spotting forecasters, as you are just mentioning, kind of then a further 10% boost from giving them uh, training tools, uh, 10% from putting them on teams and getting them to talk to one another, and then uh, maybe a 25% boost in accuracy from, uh, from using algorithms to, to process and then aggregate their, their various different predictions. Does that kind of ring true to you still today? These, these I, I guess I would have to characterize these as stylized facts um, that the baseline here is the unweighted average of the regular forecasters. It's, it's true that well, once you've identified the super forecasters and you put them into teams, they have a big advantage over regular teams and individuals working alone. That is true. And is it in the vicinity of 40%? Yes. The training number uh, of 10% is approximately right. The, the teaming number of 10% is approximately right. The algorithm number really conflates a couple of things. I mean, the algorithm number could be larger or smaller depending on how you calculate it. The, the, since the aggregation algorithms are, are piggybacking on the most recent forecasts of the best forecasters, that means they're drawing on super forecasters. So the question is, how much better can the aggregation algorithms do if you just t put the super forecasters out of the equation? And I think that number is about right, 25%. Another one is in super forecasting, there's this quote, um, the strongest predictor of rising into the ranks of super forecasters is a perpetual, a perpetual beta, uh, the degree to which one is committed to, to belief updating and self-improvement. Um, perpetual beta is roughly three times as powerful a predictor as its closest rival, uh, raw intelligence. How did you measure or define perpetual beta? I think uh, uh, yeah, Daniel couldn't find that uh, anywhere in the book. That's a very good question. <laughs> uh, and, and the self-report measure of perpetual beta does not do that work for us. What does the work for us is a measure of the frequency with which people engage in belief updating. The fre fre frequency of um, low, low magnitude frequent belief updating uh, is a powerful driver. So one of the key measures of this will just be like how frequently do people update their, update their estimates. You said three times more, uh, yeah. more, more than what? Intelligence. Which was, I think, the second second most important. Yes, fluid intelligence and well, crystallized and fluid both played a role, but fluid intelligence was the most consistent predictor. But when you, when you're dealing with a population of these for, these forecasters are all pretty smart, so there is some restriction of range. So the comparison to intelligence is not entirely fair. So you think that if you just drew people randomly from the population, then intelligence might seem like a more important factor? Y yes, I'm pretty sure that's true. In the same way that if you randomly assign admitted people into the you know, Harvard Department of Economics, uh, the GREs have become a much better predictor of who does well than, than GREs are now. And GRE predicts, is probably predicts almost nothing in performance in graduate school at Harvard. Something that's of particular interest to me is in a lot of experiments that you've run, the extrapolation algorithms are just like various different kind of br yeah, brute force forecasting methods or yeah, uh, me me mechanistic like uh, yeah, forecasting methods seem to seem to be quite a lot of different uh, human predictors. Mm -hmm. um, but th this seems to be like surprisingly little detail about the nature of these algorithms in in in, in the in the books. Maybe, maybe there's there are on papers. But it seems like algorithms are kind of a lot easier to manage than than people and uh, like a lot a lot cheaper to run potentially than uh, than super forecasters who, who would have to pay salaries to so maybe we should put just a bit less effort in trying to identify super forecasters and just put more effort into kind of uh, training people into how to do these extrapolation algorithms if extrapolation algorithms are better than most people then maybe that's like we should be focusing our attention on uh, like getting making it possible for like ordinary people just in in life to kind of use these extrapolation algorithms that are actually performing pretty well like predict no change or predict the most recent rate of change. Yeah, well, I guess I'm, I'm, I guess I'm curious to know what were the algorithms that um, well, those that are two of them. Well. Oh, yeah. those are the ones that did well, work quite well, well. Yeah, they work pretty well. I'm Interesting. Just predict no change, especially for the shorter term forecast because change is less likely in the short term. Right. I, I think one finding I, when you cross both books, uh, one one finding is that the um, people somewhat exaggerate uh, change in the short term, and but they understate it in the longer term. Okay. But uh, that, that's not entirely true. They even there, they think they're exaggerating change even in the five-year range. Yeah. So, I, I, okay, I'm, I'm thinking out loud. I should be careful what I say. <laughs> okay, this isn't in a journal. We're 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 we're, 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 we're thinking about <laughs> it. It's a conversation. But but it's an, it's an, it's a it's a good question. It doesn't take a lot of training to do that. I mean, you 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 don't need to train people to do it at all. You just have the algorithm do it. I mean, yeah. it's, uh, so I don't I don't see a need for training there. Yeah. Okay. So, th so these weren't like quite complicated uh, forecasting algorithms that would require, you know, an expert statistician or something to put them, them together. Very often, they were just like brute, like simple rules. Oh, well, my definition of an algorithm is something that can go on automatic pilot, so it does, doesn't need any human intervention. Uh, I, I think of heuristics more as something that require human human judgment. Could you imagine producing, yeah, forecasting rules of 
like yeah rules like just predict no change over this kind of time scale and for like longer time scales just like look at the long-term trend and forecast that forward that would allow people to kind of mechanistically just become like better forecasters without having to go through all this effort of beco- uh, like becoming more foxy you know there's a guy um uh, spiros Mac- macrodakis who does uh, statistical forecasting tournaments in which people are trying to predict uh, all, 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 the, all, the, all the competitors are algorithms and the, he, there, are, there are tens of thousands of time series from you know politics and economics and business and so forth all, all sorts of time series and the question is which ones perform better across these very very disparate data sets and he, and he also has machine learning in the competition sometimes too. And, and he, he finds that uh, a fairly simple, uh, damped, smoothing, exponential uh, time series thing works pretty well across an enormous range of time series. I, I honestly don't know. I mean, I, time series data often have a lot of bumps, ups and downs. Yeah. So smoothing simply means you're kind of smoothing out the, the big bumps. Yeah. And you, you, you know, it's, it's like, like, like they, you, they, they show you on uh, with, with these Wall Street um, summaries. What, what's, what's the 180 the day, 180 day moving average or sort of, sorts of numbers? Yeah. How much does that, would that be a good, would that be a good idea? Um, I think for many situations, it would help people do pretty well. Would it bring them up to super forecasting levels of performance? Sometimes it would. I mean, it's not as though the super forecasters themselves don't use algorithms. I mean, they I do. See. I mean, they're, they're, <laughs> there's a lot of them are very statistically savvy. They, they, they know more statistics than I do. And, so and to some extent, they're like a superset of some of these. Yeah, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a subset of them. Are, you know, you know, they run their own Monte Carlos. And they, <laughs> they, <laughs> they, <laughs> so you've got Nate Silver in there. Yeah, so yeah. It's, it's, I mean, the super forecast, some super forecasters are, are already hybrids in, in and of themselves. They're not, they're not, it would be a mistake to think of them all as human <laughs> yeah. because they're, they are using uh, statistical aids of various sorts. So it's, it's a very interesting question. I don't know the answer. My, my, my guess is it would help, uh, whether it would bring them all the way up to super performance. I suspect not, but it's an empirical issue. Yeah, I, I did a course in time series forecasting uh, in my undergraduate economics degree, which I think is like relatively unusual. Uh, and I think it's perhaps an underestimated uh, thing to study in terms of like changing how you think about the world and changing how you think about, yeah, ma- making making predictions about the future. Just realizing that these kind of mechanistic like order regression moving average models are actually like can actually be extremely good uh, predictors of the future and will like often spit out answers that don't seem entirely intuitive to you, but like, but, but kick your ass. <laughs> it's yeah. quite interesting. Yeah, and, and you don't even need the full uh, ARIMA, you know, the full uh, full scale thing. You, 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 they're, they're very simple, crude time series extrapolation, a la Spiros Macrodakis, can 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 perform pretty well. Uh, he, I mean, he's very concerned about data overfitting. Yeah. Um, and when you're dealing with tens of thousands of data sets, the, the advantages of the smoothing the smoothing approaches become apparent because the bumps average out. Yeah, maybe we can uh, try to get a link to, to anything that... Uh, was it Spiroff, you said? Uh, M-A-K-R-I-D-A-K-I-S. Okay, yeah. yeah, he ran a f- competition. I think it's in the... Um Oh gosh, the International Journal of Forecasting, or um, special? There's a special issue devoted to his M4 competition. Wow, uh, yeah, that sounds sounds super interesting. Uh, try, yeah, I'll try, 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 try to stick up a link for that, and maybe maybe get him get him on the show at some point. What finding in your research do you think is most likely to be wrong? What, what's most likely to fall apart? Well, I think when you hit historical discontinuities, I'm not sure there are super forecasters. So you're saying, well, we most, most need them. <laughs> they yeah. disappear on us. That's not very useful, Professor. Um, <laughs> so, I, I mean, I, I, historical discontinuities are so hard. When, when There's another, well, <laughs> I'm going to sound like I'm a Marxist because I keep I'm going to quote Karl Marx twice <laughs> in this interview. But apparently Karl Marx also said that... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a Marxist, but yeah. <laughs> when, when, when the train of history hits a curve, the intellectuals fall off. Yeah. And probably so does everyone else as well. Although. Well, it's kind of but ironic given how yeah. often the Marxists have fallen off the train of history <laughs> in, the, in the 20th century. But yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's, an, it's, an, it's an all the more apropos remark. Yeah. Um, there, there, there's a lot of truth to that. Chain predicting change is hard, and predicting dramatic change is really, really, really hard. So I think I would be doing a disservice to the world if I implied, oh, all you need to do is have the super forecaster stand vigilant, and they'll be able to uh, sound the alarm on on everything. They, 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 they too will get things wrong. But you can you can fine tune these things, uh, and you can say to them. You know, if there are some categories of risk that you're really, really concerned about missing, you can do what the VCs do, and you can lower your threshold, and you can say, look, you know, we're going to highlight certain things, even though they're very low probabilities. The way the, the current forecasting tournaments work, forecasters are incentivized for picking up on events that have, you know, are between 5 and 95 percent. 
not you know the, 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 there's not there's not much gain anymore from get, getting it really really yeah, refined so you know get distinguishing between one in a hundred thousand and one in a billion but yeah there's a huge magnitude of difference there and if the consequences are, are huge it, it, it's it, it's it, it, it's super super huge and then the question is what 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 techniques can we use and and that 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 is one that's the great challenge right now we we work on it with these Bayesian question clusters. We work on it with with, with consistency and coherence checks. But we don't have a solution to it. I I think we all have to be aware that we, we live in a in in a world that is subject to uh, potentially radical volatility. Uh, I mean, just look at the 20th century from decade to decade, and you'll see I mean, that. Now, who predicted World War One <laughs> in 1910? <laughs> virtually, virtually nobody. So certainly nobody was remotely close to how intense it would be. And if someone did, I would probably guess that they'd gotten lucky. To be honest, and that's well, that's a tricky. Yeah. yeah well, you have enough people making enough predictions. There yeah. will be a, there will be a few. But 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 with that, of course, a virtually nobody was anticipating it. I mean, the idea of a great power war to some degree, but but a war of, with that degree of lethality, yeah. really not. Uh, and I mean, they knew it was an unstable situation, but they didn't expect that that level. They, they expected it to be over pretty fast. Uh, and then out of that, you know, grows the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany and World War II, and you know, they, <laughs> so it, it puts you on a path. Now that doesn't mean that there wouldn't have been a commun uh, some communist regimes. It doesn't mean there might not have been a rise of fascism in Germany at some point. And almost certainly, nuclear weapons would have been discovered, uh, regardless of whether there was there were those wars. But the timing and the context would have been probably very different. I was having dinner with Nick Beckstead last night. I'm not sure whether whether you know Nick, but he had this question for you, which hopefully I can accurately represent. Which was, I think he thinks that you are relatively pessimistic that e that, that even super forecasters are going to be able to do better than other people or do better than kind of a random chance once we are talking about like very long term forecasts over like decades or I guess possibly even centuries. And uh, he thought that, that that might be a mistake because it seems like super forecasters using like whatever uh, styles of thinking they have, they're not just good like in one domain uh, where they like have particular expertise. They seem to be just better at making forecasts almost across the board, like everywhere that we've checked. And so maybe even though we don't yet have data, the data in to show that they are able to forecast things more accurately over, over very long time spans, that that would be a pretty reasonable expectation to, to, to bring to the table. Uh, what, what do you think of that? Um, interesting. Uh, <laughs> so it is true when you look at the, the tournaments within which the, the best forecasters excel, the questions are just incredibly heterogeneous. So, you know, you move, you, you, they have to be quick studies to do, to do this well. You're moving from me, Arctic sea ice mass to Colombian narco-terrorism to, you know, Spanish-German bond yield spreads to Syrian civil war to South China Sea island building to North Korean missile testing to, oh, it's just, it's just everything under the map, right? Yeah. The, it literally, it's all over the map <laughs> and, and it is geographically and functionally uh, extremely diverse. So you say, you know, what fraction of people can have expertise in more than about one or two of yeah. these topics? And, and the answer is nobody. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're, they have to be pretty fast generalists. They have, they have to, and then I guess that's the basis for the, for the notion that, uh, if, if they can do that, if they, if they can display that degree of cognitive dexterity in that kind, in, in the uh, IARPA tournaments, the original IARPA tournaments, where the questions were extremely heterogeneous and there weren't well-defined base rates for many of the questions, and they had to, you had to improvise a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, if they can do that there, why, why, why couldn't they do it um, going, going, going further into time? And I, I think it's a matter of how quickly you think chance compounds over time. And I don't have the exact answer to this. I, I, the magician, uh, statistician, uh, I think Percy Diaconis at Stanford once asked the question, how many times do you have to shuffle a deck of cards before all information is lost? Do you have a deck of cards, initial, a new, open up a new, new, new deck of cards, all the cards are perfectly ordered from, you know, yeah. from uh, deuces up through aces. And they're all in exact order, same same order and how many times do you have to shuffle like do a proper shuffle i guess there's a definition of what a proper shuffle is and how many how many proper shuffles do you have to do before all order is lost i think the answer is five or six okay now the necessary change is being made ask the same question about history <laughs> i mean there are things that are happening that are random and how much randomness I mean, we're not you're not getting full card shuffles <laughs> every every day or every month or every year there's like there's there are substantial pockets of stability in history yeah but how fast is the randomness compounding so the optimal forecasting frontier is going to be very very close to chance when you reach a certain point point. and looking back on 20th century history 
my guesstimate is, you know, people, there were, there were certain categories of things that I think farsighted people were anticipating. But, you know, it took a long time, even for that like, physicists, you know, the new nuclear weapon really wasn't on the radar screen until about 1930 or so. I think Einstein thought it was not, not, not a non-starter initially. Yeah. And, you know, he changed his mind and when, when Fermi got the reactor going. And <laughs> yeah. Um, well, there, there, there was someone who I think anticipated it like several years ahead and tried like moved to America and tried to sound the alarm about this risk. Like I think in the very early days of, of World War II or maybe even before. Oh, yeah. That, to remember, yeah, it was fair. Well, well, Fermi and others were, were doing that. It was someone else, I think. Who was yeah? I, I, I can't remember his name. Maybe I'll like do it. In, uh, I'll, um, I'll chime in and like uh, say, say what it is. But uh, yeah. there's actually a book about this person's efforts to try to like uh, yeah. Yeah, prevent um, the Germany from getting getting nuclear weapons first. Right. But, so there were there were there were there there were there were pockets of farsightedness. Although there you're talking about a time frame of about five years. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the letter to Roosevelt. The, yeah. The, yeah, the, yeah. The, 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 uh, that Einstein yeah. was was coaxed into writing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think it was I think it was someone who persuaded them to write that letter. Yeah. 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 yeah I right. can't remember the name. But. I'm just going to chime in here and add that the name that was escaping my memory uh, was Leo Szilard, who persuaded uh, Einstein to write a letter to Franklin Roosevelt about the possibility of nuclear weapons all the way back in August 1939, one month before Germany invaded Poland. It's uh, quite a remarkable story. We'll put up a link to the Wikipedia article about that, and you can find out more in the biography, Genius in the Shadows, The Man Behind the Bomb. All right, back to the interview. But that, that's not really far. I mean, we're, no, talking, yeah, we're talking about centuries here. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're, we're talking about, well, some of the basic technologies in place now, yeah. the theory's there, the technology's there, yeah. and there's a potential threat. Mm. So then it, it galvanized. But they probably, that bomb probably would have been developed anyway in a competitive nation state system. Mm. You, you could expect something like that to happen, but it might not have happened for another 20 or 30 years. Yeah. Or, and, and similarly, we might not have had a man on the moon until till till later yeah. uh, or conceivably earlier if Germany had, had taken a more peaceful course and Werner von Braun had been <laughs> sending yeah. him <laughs> rockets yeah that, uh, that, well, I mean the Manhattan Project was a colossal effort I think I remember reading that like one million people were indirectly involved in the Manhattan Project like even though almost like 99.9% um, of them didn't realize what they were doing but it it, yeah. it was the sort of thing that only a, a, a power like the United States was capable of doing in World War II the, 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 the other powers were exhausted and stretched yeah. And the United States had this incredible surplus capacity for waging yeah. war yeah. on two fronts. Yeah. So it was it was it was a remarkable asymmetry of, of power. Uh, but I, no, I'm not. As, yeah, I guess he's right. I mean, if you want to call me a pessimist, because I, I, I think I don't I wouldn't think they're going to do a very good job a century out. I'm not so sure they're going to yeah, do a very good a job time, a, a generation out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, when they get to five to ten years, maybe there's going to be some advantage, but it's going to be increasingly small. Yeah, I guess I it think. just depends on kind of the nature of the question. Because if you're saying, yeah, who's going to be prime minister of the UK in 50 years' time? I mean, like, no, yeah, no super forecasters. <laughs> like, everyone is just back to chance. They're just like guessing names at that point. Yeah. But something like oh, like which party will like be in power? Like, maybe you can get like a little bit of resolution there. And so, for example, if you're trying to like forecast progress in artificial intelligence, it seems like. Uh, forecasting like at what point do you get like transformative change like at what point will the algorithms reach the point at which you can get transformative change like very very hard but trying to like potentially forecast uh, just the amount of computational ability that we'll have or yeah how how fast will computer chips be seems like potentially we can like have something to say about that even like looking 50 or 100 years out just because we have like enough of a historical record and there does seem to be trends there so it gets gets much harder no doubt but it's uh I think super forecasters might be able to do better than better than uh, just like chimps throwing at dartboards. Um, for some for some things, yes. I, I don't know. Is, is, is Moore's law still alive and kicking? And, uh, it, it it changed, but <laughs> uh, so like, but the thing is, I think it would not have been unreasonable to, to like. Uh, well, I think actually people did predict like because there was like engineering practical reasons why that people expected it to slow down, it, it, and indeed it, it did. So, yeah, yeah. so it's like there we did to kind of have some knowledge and like mm -hmm. yeah, expertise can like can help you to forecast. Yeah, yeah I mean, like, I, I, sometimes I, I, trends hold. Like yeah. there, there might be like a worth having a crack at and 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 maybe i'm naive but i think when when astronomers and astrophysicists tell me that the sun is going to go supernova <laughs> in, in, in three or four billion years yeah. I, I think they're probably right it's, like it's going to come close to the earth's orbit it's going to yeah. destroy all life on the planet yeah. <laughs> some things are kind of mechanistic uh, it, and yeah there, there are some categories of things where i there, there are time scales and there are levels of determinism in certain law, operating laws where we have enough confidence that we, we think we can extrapolate out 
And it's, it, I mean, it's, it, where's, where's climate on that continuum? Uh, that, that, that's you know. somewhere in between, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's safe to say they're not very useful. Yeah, you have this uh, chapter, or maybe it's some multiple chapters in um, Expert Political Judgment, which is uh, which I just really love talking about, yeah, how chaotic the world is and how like things that seem like they're inevitable aren't inevitable. I guess, yeah, this is a question that I had a lot when I was a teenager. It's like, is the world like following like mechanistic laws that like, cause things to go the way they do, kind of uh, no matter what I do? Or yeah. is it just the case that like the world's incredibly chaotic and one person can make a difference? And I basically think just having thought about it a lot I feel like you agree that kind of one person can change the course of history if they if they can get access to kind of yeah power or, or knowledge potentially just because it's just so ran like there's so much randomness in like what, what decisions people make uh, and yeah and it all like uh, spirals out do you agree and can the decisions of like one person making a concerted effort like change what happens in in the future uh, or, or are they just trapped by kind of structural forces that prevent them from like ever really materially changing things in the long term I think that most people, most of the time, are very much constrained by systemic forces, uh, that we're group living creatures and we, we, we do what we do uh, because we like to get along with the people around us. I think there are exceptional situations in which individuals have made a, a big difference. I mean, the favorite example, if we were to think of one person in the 20th century who seemed to do things that were really out of the ordinary, yeah. who would it be? Uh, I guess like the H word. Is it? Are you thinking of Hitler or? Thinking, yeah, I'm thinking yeah. the H word. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess like Stalin and Mao as well. Right. Also, well, yeah. well, yeah, but to a lesser degree. I mean, I'm I just say that they're all bad. You could certainly, I can certainly imagine that China, if it if it had a pragmatic leadership like Deng Xiaoping yeah. from 1949 onward, would one. have a per capita income close to Taiwan, hmm. and would be by far the largest economy. You know, all yeah. other things being equal. Uh, of course, that assumes they're not going to get involved in the Korean War and they're not going to be embargoed by the U.S. And there's a lot of you know, things yeah. like that. I mean, it depends on, depends on how the, the Chinese Civil War worked itself out. But China went into some con unnecessary convulsions that were seemed to be very linked to the whims of one person, Mao Zedong, yeah. the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution, which are yeah. very, very costly in lives and, yeah. and prosperity and growth. Okay, yeah, I, mean, I guess I expected that you might be a little bit more enthusiastic about the idea that like decisions that maybe even don't seem so consequential at the time and maybe where it, it, it's not possible to forecast exactly what effect they're going to have that like mm -hmm. you know the action of just like a minister in the UK uh, could like end up having like unforeseen and, and really quite important important impacts in, in, in the long term like butterfly like, effects yeah butterfly effects basically because um, I guess it seemed like that I th as, as I recall that that chapter in that book seem to like mm -hmm. say no the world is like really quite chaotic but butterfly effects are quite real and like and, and it's it's something of an illusion that like history is just deterministic and, and, and is destined predestined to go in a particular direction well I we do, we, 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 we do, I know you're talking about expert political judgment or super forecasting, but but I, I think we're qualified in that. I, I don't I don't I don't think we know how you how common butterfly effects are. Uh, it's certainly conceptually very easy. I mean, the logical systems theory case for butterfly effects is yeah. there is overwhelming. I think you can also come um, up with case studies that seem kind of compelling, where you just like look at one person. Or you, or you just like, I guess I speak to people in government, and they're like, "This happened because this person did this thing, and there's yeah. no way it would have happened otherwise." Okay. It just happens all the time. So take the Danny Kahneman thought experiment: if Hitler, Stalin, and Mao had been born as girls rather than boys, yeah. uh, 20th century history would have unfolded radically differently. Because everybody, when people think of names in 20th century, say, "Well, who made a difference?" Mm. We say, "Well." The H word, the S word, and the M word. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Hitler, Stalin, Mao. I mean, they 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 they, they were responsible. Movers and shakers in that more, time. More, they, right. They they killed a lot of people, and they made of they they were transformative uh, in 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 their very distinctive ways. Um, and if they had been born girls, there's not a snowball's chance in hell that they would have ever risen risen to the leadership of the Nazi Party or the Soviet Communist Party or the Chinese Communist Party because yeah. sex rule norms in the eight in, in, in the early nineteenth century were such that right, yeah. that just Good wasn't enough. going to happen. Yeah. Um, now, it's an interesting thought experiment it, for a very key reason. It, 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 that, that world, before the, the fertilization event of the eggs, was 0.125 probable. One-eighth, right? The yeah, world, yeah. The world yeah. in which they're all male hmm. is also 0.125 probable. Yeah. So the counterfactual world, all female, is hmm. equally probable hmm. with, to the actual world that did materialize. So you have... A, a very nice case where the the, the possible and, and the actual yeah. ex ante were equal probable, and that seem that that seems to many people to say, oh yeah, you know, there really is something very fluky about yeah. the world we're inhabiting. Now, of course, there are people who say 
you know, there, there's a very strong form of the actor dispensability thesis says, you know, no Hitler. Well, you have another extreme right winger in Germany, may, yeah. maybe even smarter and maybe cleverer. He could, you know, do a much better job than, than Hitler. Yeah. And and Stalin, you know, well, that, that, they were kind of a natural sequel to Leninism. And, and Mao, well, that's just a natural sequel to Stalinism. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I guess so, with Hitler, I find that story, like, not very plausible at all, that, uh, that without Hitler, some, it, just, it was inevitable that you'd have, like, right wing extremism in, in Germany. Yeah. But even, I guess, even, I guess even, Stalin, even after losing World War One and the Versailles Treaty, yeah, I, I, to me that I guess like maybe, yeah, here I'm just like making that kind of factual reasoning and, and the I'm Great Depression. Like, yeah, I, I mean, well, but other countries didn't like. Not every country kind of had had a right wing resurgence like this. You know, the mm-hmm. UK didn't, and I guess I don't really believe that it's like it was fundamentally cultural different uh, drive. I mean, yeah, I agree. There's like there was a certain probability, but I think it's like nowhere near certain that you'd get like something like that. And right. I guess I, I feel with Stalin, I was going to say that it feels like there's a bit more of a stronger case that there were strongly systemic reasons that like flowing out of Leninism, uh, like that the most brutal people would kind of rise to the top of the of, of the Communist Party. And if it wasn't Stalin, it might have been some other brutal person who was part of that that whole revolution. Yeah. But yeah, I guess here. Yeah, now now I'm really stuck in the weeds of like kind of factual reasoning well, and making well, claims. Well, Trotsky wasn't exactly a nice guy. Like, yeah. <laughs> there were a few like nicer ones, but I feel like they, they kind of systematically got edged out. So it's a bit more deterministic, at least in my mind. This is the story that I want to tell. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Uh, I guess I'll have to go back and read that chapter and see uh, how qualified the, the claim about the, the, the butterfly effect was. I, I think we, say, we, we, we saw it as grounds for extreme epistemic pessimism about forecasting. We, there, I think we laid out five reasons why we thought uh, forecasting would be extremely, why, why some people thought the whole idea of even looking for any forecasting accuracy at all is a bit of a fool's errand. And we, we, obviously we don't go that far. We, 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 we think there's, there's some room for improvement uh, and it requires concerted effort. Yeah. Do you, do you watch the show Rick and Morty? No, I haven't seen it. Oh, I think you might. I think you might like it. It's a it's a, it's a, it's a cartoon where it's, it's like very clever, and uh, they go off into like different multiverses. There's like many different. It, it, it indulges kind of many world hypothesis that kind of all these things are possible, and you can imagine that you can travel between them. Let's uh, <laughs> see if I can convince you to watch it. It, it sounds like the world me. I'm in with the focus and then Civ Five. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> Lots of um, possible worlds there. <laughs> speaking of fiction, uh, have you ever read the Foundation series by Asimov? Uh, no, I haven't. I, I've, I've had it quoted at me many times before, and I've seen quotes from it. I guess, uh, yeah, that book originally starts out with this idea that someone's invented a field of knowledge that allows them to, yeah, to, to accurately predict things over hundreds or thousands of years, uh, like very specific things, which is probably not, not possible. Even with like very advanced technology, it probably is just impractical, unless you like manage to set up society in some very mechanistic and deterministic way that it's very different from the present. But then over time, I think Asimov realized by like the third or fourth book, like how ridiculous this premise was. And so he started like throwing things in the range that the, the, the predictions really start going wrong because it's like, you know, sweet, generous, like very strange events that uh, I guess you've probably heard this thing that, uh, yeah. As a more of like, yeah, he, he like ceased to believe in kind of deterministic roles and, 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 and things like go off the rails in the, in the series. I, I guess I'm waiting for the HBO series. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, um, I, I think they could, they could maybe pull that off. So a uh, super forecasting, I guess you probably wrote it about five years ago now. How might a new edition of super forecasting differ if, if you were writing it today? Oh, tough, tough question. Uh, I'd have to write it before I could answer that question. I mean, so it's kind of like asking people to predict inventions, right? If I, if I could predict in it, in it whether something's going to be invented, why wouldn't I just invent it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so people in the, in the audience uh, wanted to know, uh, they'd, they'd heard, uh, last episode we talked about extremizing a bunch, uh, how if like you know, 10 people will predict that something is kind of 80% likely, then, then maybe an aggregate, you should actually think it's 90% likely because uh, they're all kind of hedging a little bit too much because uh, they only have uh, an access to, to part of the knowledge that the group has. Some people had heard that maybe this was kind of a, a variance increasing strategy that had helped uh, the, the Good Judgment Project to, w- to win some tournaments. But like, actually, it was what, what it was doing was like increasing your probability of coming first and increasing your probability of, of, of coming last just by like making like stronger, bolder claims. Uh, like, yeah, being willing to to, um, to 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 bet all of your all of your chips on on, on claims. Is there anything to that in, in follow up research that maybe extremizing doesn't look as good as it did uh, a couple of years ago? It's it's an it's an interesting question about whether you'd want to extremize in a world that uh, was more volatile than the 2011 to 2015 time frame. And yeah, there clearly are worlds in which extremizing will cause you to crash and burn. I think that's fair. Um, or just like everything changes kind of all at once yes, for some related reason. Yes. So when, whether, whether or not you're going to use extremizing, I think, hinges on the kinds of questions that you're answering and what you the expected value of positive and negative and, and of correct and incorrect answers is that's a that's it's a cautious answer it, it, but, it, but. It, it's a te- yeah it, 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 the answer is it really it depends enormously on the context 
and, on, and, and, and a calculus. And the calculus we were using inside the tournament was a pure Briar score calculus contoured around the events that IARPA was asking about within a particular time frame. And if you had a different accuracy function, different utility function, and a world with different predictive properties, you would want to adjust. That's kind of a boring answer, but it, it, I, 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 I'm, I guess I'm acknowledging that, 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 that I, I, was, I was always nervous about extremizing. I mean, I, I, when I would compare my judgments, my intuitive judgments to the extremizing algorithm, I would say, oh, my God. This is incredible, yeah. <laughs> to going that far. be that confident, yeah. <laughs> but it, 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 it worked remarkably well. And, you know, bear in mind, I think the, most, the, the, the best extremizing algorithms are ones that are, 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 are sensitive to the cognitive diversity of the crowd. So it's when people who disagree are suddenly start agreeing that you're increasing your confidence in extremizing. It's not just you're taking the most recent forecast or the best forecasters. Like you're, you're, people you're saying, who are normally negatively correlated suddenly start becoming correlated on the one question. Yeah, yeah. And that, that does tell you something uh, mm-hmm. that you didn't know before. And, and, that, and, that, and that gives you reason to be, um, to, to be more extreme. Uh, but again, it, it, it hinges on whether you, if you have a deep aversion to a false negative, for example, or a false positive, uh, you're, you're going to need to adjust your, your accuracy function. Yeah, one of your recent papers is, um, uh, I think, coming out this year, uh, is, are markets more accurate than polls? Uh, the surprising in- informational value of just asking, uh, where there you kind of suggest that perhaps we don't need predictions, prediction markets where we can just kind of survey people on their, on their probability estimates of different things. But why do you think it is that kind of, yeah, the motivation or the, or the rewards of prediction markets aren't as necessary as perhaps some, some listeners think they are? I, th- I think prediction markets are very valuable. I mean, you, you really, we, for tournaments are really only beating prediction markets under certain conditions. And they're beating, they're beating uh, prediction markets when you use the very best extremizing algorithms and you have a lot of data to fine-tune the algorithm. And the prediction markets themselves are not deep and liquid. So if you have a strong forecasting tournament and a f- prediction market that is a little bit anemic, I think the prediction market will indeed lose. The tough question is whether really strong forecasting tournaments can outperform deep liquid markets. And, that, and that's a, a, something that still remains to be determined. But you think about it, prediction markets in a sense are, are doing almost automatically a lot of the things that the aggregation algorithms are doing. They're upweighting the most recent forecasts of the most, high, of the most highly capitalized confident betters, right? Yeah. Have any sectors of society or government started to embrace forecasting more in the, in the last couple of years? And maybe a follow-up question would be, if you can snap your fingers and just have one organization begin regularly using uh, proper forecasting methods, uh, which, which one might it be? Well, forecasting tournaments are a difficult sell um, because they, 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 they challenge stale status hierarchies. I mean, imagine, you know, that I'm, imagine that instead of being an academic, I started in the intelligence community as an analyst 40 years ago. And I was a China specialist, and I kind of worked my way up the ranks, and finally I made it out of the National Intelligence Council and kind of become a big shot, and maybe I get to participate in the occasional presidential daily briefing, or maybe when I'm beside the near, close to the president when he's meeting with Xi Jinping. Or, and after 40 years, that's a lifetime of accomplishment, of working and doing these reports and playing by the rules and playing by the epistemic ground rules of the intelligence community, of, of drafting concise, compelling narratives that when sent up to the policy community, people say, yeah, I think I learned something I didn't know before and promote that guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then someone comes along from the R&D branch of the intelligence community and says, hey, you know what? We want to run these forecasting tournaments and we want to see whether 25-year-olds can do a better job than 65-year-olds at predicting the course of events in China. You know, what's going on with the Chinese economy, Chinese domestic political system? How are they going to respond to the trade war? What are they going to do with Hong Kong? What are you going to do with Taiwan? What are you going to do with this island? What are they going to do with North Korea? All those things. And it turns out that the 25-year-olds are outperforming the 65-year-olds like yeah. me. It doesn't take a lot of imagination to suppose that the, 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 uh, the more senior people are going to be decidedly unenthusiastic about this innovation. Yeah. This list looks like a superficial kind of idea that a bunch of nerdy computer programmer, neo-positivist types might, yeah. might come up with, <laughs> but it's, it's not something serious people should, should entertain. So we talked a lot about Tom Friedman and then the super forecasting book as a kind of a, a prototype of uh, um, a style of journalism that seems, uh, from, a, from a forecasting point of view, uh, uh, to put it charitably superficial, <laughs> put it more harshly reckless. Yeah. <laughs> but at any at any rate, it it it, it, it it's very very difficult to figure out what he's exactly what exactly he's saying. So 
I mean, so he, you know, you're not going to expect him to be very favorable. You're not going to expect most op-ed people to be very favorable because it's, it's perceived as a as an attack on how they how they do things. And they're they're very intelligent people. They're 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 very verbal. They're very knowledgeable. Uh, they have a career. They have a and they have a lot of reputational capital on the approach that they've taken. And the, the notion that these forecasting tournaments could even partly supplant or, or complement the expertise they have is dissonant. The notion that they would completely displace them is anathema. <laughs> yeah. But even partial displacement, I think, produces resistance. So I think that's why forecasting tournaments are a hard sell. E- even though the intelligence community, I think, is, is advanced forecasting tournaments more than any other research sponsor to date, I don't think they fully embraced them by any means. Yeah. Uh, I, I, th- I think it's, their status is very precarious. Yeah. Uh, I think it's quite possible that, that my intelligence community prediction market and forecasting tournaments could even disappear. It, it hinges on top top management and funding and all, all sorts of things. And, and so I, I don't think it's strongly incentivized. I don't think it's transformative yet. Do I think it will be? Yes, I do. I, I, I think the long term in the long term, <laughs> we'll, we'll, all, we'll all be dead. Yeah. But uh, I, and it may, it may be beyond my, my, my life expectancy, but I, I, I do see a trajectory toward more, more, more thoughtful efforts to understand uncertainty, to, to, to integrate more statistical and more narrativist modes of understanding the world. Uh, I, th- I think that's going to continue. It's going to be halting. Uh, it's hard for AI to break into this area for the reasons we discussed earlier, the, the elusive base rates and uh, it's, it, machine learning. Is, it's hard for it to get traction on these kinds of questions. But I'm, I'm, I, I do believe that, <laughs> there, if, insofar as I believe there's an arc of history, I do believe, in, I guess I'm enough of a pinker optimist, that I think there is uh, a growth of knowledge, a growth of enlightenment, and that uh, we will become more circumspect about what our cognitive limitations are. We'll become more aware of when we're fooling ourselves and fooling other people. We'll become more demagogue sensitive. Um, I realize making those kind of long-term forecasts in the current environment makes me sound ab- almost delusional, <laughs> but uh, it, 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 it's, it's how I see things. And I, 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 I would think by 2030 or 2040, um, the, the forecast will age pretty well, even though it looks pretty stupid right now. <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, maybe, dear listener, you can go into the U.S. intelligence services and, and preserve the budgets of uh, forecasting <laughs> and, and reasonableness and, and quantitative accuracy. Mm-hmm. You, you had this idea of um, uh, trying to uh, quanti- uh, like make uh, quantitative predictions out of the claims that people like Thomas Friedman make in, in op-ed pages uh, as, uh, in order to kind of hold them to account for what they say. Has anyone, has anyone embraced that idea yet? Oh, we've tried that. And we, we, there, there are some people for whom it's, almost, it's, it's extremely difficult. I, I wouldn't say he's all that much harder than, 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 than many other pundits, though. We, when so when someone says there's a distinct possibility something's going to occur, even something really dramatic like you know, oh if there's a distinct possibility of a, a nuclear war in the Korean Peninsula or in, between India and Pakistan, there's a distinct possibility of a Euro meltdown. Or, when people hear those words, those words it sounds as though they've heard they've learned something important. Distinct possibility takes on a, a tinge. Oh, something dramatic. Distinct possibility. My goodness, I'm learning something I didn't previously know. But distinct possibility on close inspection, when you ask people what it means uh, and, and, and the meanings it can be given after the fact, uh, it means anything between 20 and 80%. Uh, it, it straddles both sides of maybe. And there's very, it's very difficult uh, to figure out whether someone who said distinct possibility, something happening, uh, is well calibrated or, or, or terribly calibrated. But what is clear, though, is that the length, we resonate to the language. Um, and we don't resonate to the numbers in the same way. Persuading people that there are important categories of decisions where they should be more willing to go with uh, quant estimates is going to be a big uphill struggle. I think it's also a true in medicine and other fields as well, by the way. Uh, it's not just in politics. You, you try, try getting a probability out of your doctor. Yeah, yeah I know. Well, yeah, it's, it's incredible that, people, that they're unwilling to do that, even though it's so important. I assume it's like legal reasons, or maybe they just like don't feel qualified even themselves to, to give estimates like that. But yeah, and, and lawyers as well. They, they, they perpetually refuse to give you any probability judgment. Well, um, yeah, and, and they obviously have base rates they could be using. Yeah, so. yeah, totally. 
a great source of frustration yeah. to me. But, but but they think that you, the consumer, are not sophisticated. If they no. do know that, if they do know what the answer is, they 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 they, they would argue that you would probably misuse it, and it's quite possible they don't know the answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A concept that I that I heard recently, if I can uh, verge, perhaps I'm, I'm being slightly offensive for a second, is this idea of kind of verbal land. That I think sometimes you find people who are like very good at speaking, very good at using language, but say don't have any quantitative training really, and sometimes they say things that. I just imagine if they start, if they went into a like quantitative mindset for a minute and started like trying to like write this out in a more mathematical way, they'd see that it's like gibberish or inconsistent or just like can't possibly be justified. But and and like people like that who are like very good speakers, very good communicators, but like yeah, don't have the ne- the necessary like quantitative training in like at least some some discipline that like that provides some rigor to their internal reasoning. I think that can be incredibly dangerous. Yeah, this idea. Of, yeah, people need to get out of verbal land sometime and like actually like use some numbers, throw some numbers in there. Um, amen. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Speaking of which, on a previous episode, um, Spencer Greenberg described kind of how to do Bayesian updating on the fly using like odds ratios and, and Bayes factors in response to kind of evidence that you observe. Mm-hmm. When, if ever, do you think it's kind of uh, sensible to use this kind of explicit Bayesian, uh, Bayesian reasoning? Perhaps uh, when you're like, say, making adjustments away from, from the outside view and, and base rates and reference classes. That doesn't exactly work. Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Do, do you think, that, do super forecasters do that? Do, do you do that? Yes, yes, I think they do. Yeah. And we encourage them to do it in Champs Nil. I mean, it's, it's part of Champs Nil. We I mean, we, we we introduce the concept of a likelihood ratio, and we say, you know, this is, you know, yeah, that's that's how to update. Well, um, it's 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 a, you know, not, don't, it's not that the numbers are sacred in the ratio likelihood ratio because it's all guesstimates. But you're you're, you're making it, your guesstimates precise, yeah. and it makes it easier to change them uh, as if, because you know you you shouldn't be anchoring on them. That that's actually one of the other things to you know the the peril of using numbers uh, and is, is not appreciating how noisy the numbers are. And, and I guess that's maybe part of the rationale why, why the doctors and so forth don't want you to have the numbers because they think you're going you're gonna to anchor Treat too much. You're, you're going you're to anchor too much on them. Yeah. And, and there's probably some truth to that. Um, yeah. And also, you're, they, they, they think that we, we, the doctor says there's an 80% chance you're going to take that as a certainty. Mm. You're, you're safe. Right, as we were discussing earlier. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I guess we find uh, and that. And then you'll be very annoyed <laughs> 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 when you're not. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, an economist I really like, Bent Fieberg. I'm not sure quite how to pronounce his name. Has done some, some really great work on uh, uh, like the just extent, uh, the intense and like consistent over optimism in, in, in planning deadlines and cost, cost forecasts for, for, for mega projects, yes. like, you know, massive yeah. bridges, huge buildings. Yeah, that kind I of think thing. lovely work. Yes. Uh, so, for example, his like UK team that, that looks into this estimated that the successful delivery uh, was likely for only 20 percent of the UK government's uh, major like uh, major infrastructure projects. Uh, have you considered using forecasting teams to kind of uh, call bullshit on some of the some of the mega project? Uh, yeah. Over over optimism that you get from, I guess, contractors and governments. I think he has. Okay, yeah, um, I, he's I, taken I, that. I, I know he's been in a conversation with my co-author Dan Gardner. I, do, I don't know if they're going to do anything together, but uh, it, it's it's a domain ripe for application. Yes, I guess. Yeah, in a broader sense, I see your view, uh, your, your your work as like aiming to make yeah people more rational, more reasonable, uh, sometimes more moderate. Um, and I guess in particular to help like big institutions that have a lot of power to, to do good or harm to, to make wiser decisions as a collective group and avoid kind of the, the traps that you get there. Is there any other research or training that, that shares this goal, which you think is kind of uh, interesting or promising that it might be worth drawing people's attention to? Well, in some ways, the, 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 the huge flour- the flourishing of, of error and bias research and judgment decision making stimulated by Kahneman and Tversky is, is core of a yeah. lot of this. I remember that at the beginning of Thinking Fast and Slow, Danny Kahneman uh, says uh, his goal is to improve the quality of water cooler conversation. I thought that was <laughs> it was it was cute, but it was very serious. I mean, it, it, he 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 want want why well, he wants to enrich the vocabulary we use for judging judgment, and in in that sense, my research is in the, is in very much the same spirit. We, we want to enrich the vocabulary for judging judgment. And we want to make people more resistant to what I see as the most the most dangerous of all the heuristics that Kahneman and Tversky studied, which is the um, the attribution substitution heuristic. We, we, we nicknamed it the bait and switch heuristic, but it, it it's what you were pointing to earlier. It it it's that you confront a really difficult question about climate change or a really difficult question about um, the economy or the Persian Gulf or God knows what, you confront a really difficult question and someone comes along and seems to have a lot of status and well-dressed, smooth talker, well-dressed, yeah. uh, smooth talker uh, well-connected, well-networked, and gives you a, a story. And you, you, you slip into, think, into answering another question. 
you're no longer in- trying to answer the question at hand about China or the economy or climate. You're, you're, answering, you're trying to answer, is this the sort of person, does this person look like the sort of person who would know the answer to this question? And the answer there is a resounding yes. <laughs> this person clearly looks like that. And uh, you run with it. Uh, you, 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 you then act as though the answer to the easy question is also the answer to the hard question. You conflate the things in your mind. I think it's that conflation we're, we're trying to fight against. Uh, I think that conflation is an enormously powerful force. Um, it's not something that you can eliminate by simply talking about it here and saying, oh, watch out for that, <laughs> because you'll, you'll fall for it 10 seconds later. Yeah. I mean, um, it's, it's very, it's very hard. how we're designed to some extent. Yeah. We're, we, we, we are wired up to look for credibility cues and status cues, and, 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 and we're, we're deferential toward status, and we're deferential toward the correlated markers of status. And that's just the way we are. And forecasting tournaments that challenge the status hierarchy, you should expect we'll have a hard time. Out of curiosity, are there any majors, like mentioning perhaps, say, engineering, that, they're just, that are associated with being a better forecaster? Is that something that you've uh, looked into? It, it, so far, I, yes. To some degree, we've, we've noticed correlations. And it, it helps to be uh, backgrounds in economics and finance and engineering, computer programming, are uh, positive are positively related to very I think those types of people are overrepresented in the super forecasting pool. I think there are people from all lines of work. I'm surprised that there are, are, aren't more political scientists involved or more social scientists. I wish there were. I'm surprised that it's as uh, lopsidedly male as it is. I wish there were more females. I wish there were uh, a, lot, a lot of people, a, lot, a wider range of people were involved in this. And I, here, here's, a, here's a rule of thumb. Forecasting tournaments appeal more to people who are out of power, who are lower status. If you have high status, if you already have it made, forecasting tournaments look risky and suspect and destabilizing. So it, it tends, tends to appeal to younger, upwardly mobile, ambitious, more male than female, not necessarily. I mean, there are some females, uh, and, and people in STEM. STEM disciplines. Yeah. Uh, it appeals to them. Um, Maybe because they're not in government as often. <laughs> um, or, yeah. Well, you know, there are, there are people in certain branches of government, in intelligence, intelligence community, in DOD, in Treasury, in uh, the Federal Reserve. Uh, there are many parts in CBO, people who are very open to this. They're not the majority, yeah. but, they're, <laughs> so, yeah. but government's a big place. <laughs> So we've got this, uh, what we call the problem profile on um, improving decision-making in big institutions uh, as kind of a, a career track. Um, and kind of one, one weakness of the article uh, at present is that it, uh, we don't have that, that many success stories other than kind of your work and like your various disciples and, and other, other research associates. Do you know of any other success stories of people who've like helped to make government or big organizations uh, more reasonable that, that, that we could highlight as kind of models of like uh, yeah, career paths that other people might be able to, to, to mimic? I think these things hinge a lot on who is in charge at any given moment. I find it hard to imagine President Trump being all that open to changing his mind in response to a forecasting tournament. Um, How likely would President Obama be to have done that? My guess is a bit more likely, yeah, maybe quite a bit more likely. Do we think that someone is less of a leader because that leader is willing to change his or her mind in response? And what, what we didn't it's weakness. We didn't. We didn't elect the forecasting tournament. We elected you. Yeah. <laughs> we expect you to make the decisions. We don't expect you to delegate them to some um, Deus ex machina here. So I, I, I think progress is halting, and it, it, it's, it's very specific to the particular executives in charge. I guess it's like just the kind of technocratic moves in general, or like the cost benefit analysis people, or like law and economics people, maybe are like examples of people who've like tried to make bureaucracies like more, more sensible. Yes, yes. I mean, I, I, I think that there are organizations like the Gates Foundation that try very explicitly. I think there are parts of the intelligence community that try very explicitly to base their recommendations on ex- uh, probability estimates. Yes. I think there are organi- lots of organizations in Wall Street that try to do that. Pretty I think some, some central banks try to do that. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Bridgewater is this big hedge fund that has this kind of unusual culture that seems to like in some ways kind of echo the like directness and clarity uh, of, of forecasting. Do, do you have any view on, on them or are you too aware of what, what the culture is like? Yeah, I am. In fact, a graduate student who uh, jo- joined uh, Wharton a year or two ago came from Bridgewater and gave us an interesting tutorial on the conversational norms there. 
It's, it's, it's Ray, quite extreme. Ray, you can Ray, look it up. Ray, Ray Dalio has explained it in his book, yeah. and it, 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 it is quite well known. And uh, many of the things he does, I think, are essentially good ideas. Uh, they, 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 they take a real toll, though, on human beings. They require a degree of rigor and transparency and, and, and candor that people find oppressive. I gather the turnover rate is quite high there. At least among new people, definitely. Um, yeah. Yeah, 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 right, right. But when, when, once, once you've got a, a self-selected group, it seems to work pretty well. And you can say, well, that's sort of true of super forecasters too, isn't it? You've got a lot of attrition there as well. And, and yes, the, the answer is uh, it's not everybody's cup of tea. So, yeah, I think the convergence is real. Uh, I think uh, the idea of being very explicit about what the goal of a conversation is at the outset making clear that there are, there are lots, of, lots of agenda people have when they have conversations, right? Uh, it's not just getting to the truth. It's you know, look, looking good and avoid, avoiding being, em, 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 being yeah. not getting embarrassed. and um, Avoiding getting people aside, which like, is a necessary thing sometimes. Yeah. Right. And, and, and nowadays, you know, with we have an instant outrage kind of culture, you know, people have to be very careful about what they say. You get a, you get a word out of place and somebody's going to get upset. So there, there, there's a great deal of risk aversion and, and social posturing uh, that gets in the way of truth seeking. The thing about for, the thing that's so unusual about forecasting tournaments is that they ask people to play, and the thing that's so unusual about Bridgewater is that they ask people to play a pure accuracy game. They only care about getting to the truth faster. And, and they, they seem to have made a lot of money out of it. And, and, and they seem to have been uh, pretty darn successful at it, yeah. Yeah, I guess it hadn't occurred to me actually until this conversation that uh, we might be able to imagine... Um, Bridgewater is kind of a laboratory of like, I mean, it's it's actually very shocking to even me. And like, it seems very extreme, the kind of method that, that they use internally to try to increase accuracy. And obviously, they're not going to trans, transfer easily across to a lot of other organizations. But there might be like things in that general direction or like lessons that they learn that might be more transferable. And you could view that as kind of a research lab almost in, in, in its own way. Yeah, it, very much so. And I, I think one of the things I really like about their model for super forecasting is you want to reward people, not just for being good forecasters, but for helping other people become good forecasters. So you get you gain social capital you gain reputation uh not only by being having the best prior score you get it by helping other people so that that, that is that's very valuable and and there's a, it can set up a virtuous learning cycle are there any important ways that kind of institutional or yeah collective rationality differs from from individual or yeah, small group rationality in your view and are there any kind of implications that that has for like how we ought to try, try to improve you know decision making in, in big organizations I think that the best individual forecasters do often seem to talk to themselves as if they have more than one mind, as if there are, like Walt Whitman famously wrote, I, I am large, I contain multitudes. Um, I'm not sure they contain multitudes, <laughs> but, but the, they have interesting internal conversations with themselves. I guess possibly organizations can spread that across people rather yeah, than requiring. Yeah. So you could say, you know, I, the term I use in the expert political judgment, I, I borrowed from um, Harold Bloom, uh, who is a Shakespeare scholar. And he, he felt that, that, uh, that one of the things that made Shakespeare so special, he, he was a great lover of Shakespeare, he was a Yale, Yale professor for many years. And he, he, he said that good judgment in, 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 in Shakespeare requires mastering the art of self-overhearing. That is, the, the characters who can listen to themselves talk to themselves. Mm, that sounds a bit convoluted, um, but you listen to yourself, talk to yourself, and you decide, you decide whether you like what you're hearing. <laughs> am, am I, am I, do I sound like a self-justifying twit? <laughs> or do I sound like a thoughtful person who's actually trying to grapple with the truth? And I think you want to incentivize people to move in that direction. You'll, you'll be a better contributor to the conversation if you master the art of self-overhearing. You'll also be better at quantifying uncertainty in these, in these exercises. What do you think it would look like to, to, to live in a world where um, yeah, elites around the world are, are better at predicting kind of social and political trends? And how confident are you that this world would, would be safer, I suppose, especially from kind of war and, war and catastrophes? I think that in a, in a competitive nation-state system where there's no world government, uh, that even intelligent, self-aware leaders will have serious conflicts of interest, and and there will not that there's, there's no guarantee of of peace and comedy. But I, I think you're less likely to observe gross miscalculations, either in trade negotiations or in nuclear negotiations. I think you're a lot more likely to see an appreciation of the need to have uh, systems that prevent accidental war 
and that prevent and put constraints on, on, on cyber and bio warfare competition as well as nuclear. So I th- those would be things I think would fall out fairly naturally from intelligent leaders who want to preserve their power and the influence of their nations, but also want to avoid cataclysms. So in that sense, yes, I, I, I think the world would be... I'm, so I'm not utopian about it. I, I, I think we, we would still live in a very imperfect world, but if we lived in a world in which the top leadership of every country was open to consulting competently, technocratically run forecasting tournaments for estimates on key issues, we would, on balance, be uh, better off. Yeah. I guess one person was trying to convince me that this wasn't the case uh, recently. So one thing is that in as much as you uh, like feel like you have a better grasp of what's going to happen, then possibly you become like a bit more reckless. You become like more willing to, to ride the line because uh, the future seems less unpredictable and risky. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure whether that actually, actually... Well, I suppose in as much as they have an accurate perception of like the risks that they're creating, maybe that isn't so bad. Well, yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, so let's say for sake of argument that a leader was more, the the Trumpian theory of trade, that the United States is better off uh, doing bilateral deals than multilateral deals because the United States has more bargaining power that way. I think that's maybe one of his theories. I, I can't read. I, I, I can't read his mind, but yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing. And, and that, so it's easy, relatively easy, for the United States to beat up Canada or Mexico. Take um, them one by one. Harder for China on China, but yeah. going to try. Yeah. <laughs> it's trying. Yeah. Uh, easier, easier on Japan and South Korea because of their dependency on the U.S. I mean, there are categories of things that you could do if, if you had a purely transactional theory of the world and you had an accurate. You had accurate probability estimates of the world. How far could you push the advantage of your country? And in the case of the United States, you might be able to push it further in the short term, but you might trigger long-term resentment that would be to your detriment in the long term. That's, I think, what people are worried about in the the con. I think that's the the more thoughtful uh, worry about Trump. I think part of what's going wrong there is that he thinks of reducing your own tariffs as a, as a bad thing, whereas I think of it as just like an extra benefit. It's like good when they reduce their tariffs, and then it's like even better when you reduce your own tariffs because you're just like you know throwing rocks in your own harbor. But that's right. Well, but he he looks at it more as a power game than a mu- mutual benefit. Econo- it's economic game. So, so there is a, the, the real politic view of, of of trade is quite different from the neoclassical economic view yeah. of trade. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as I, as I learn every day. Um, <laughs> if uh, if you're going to switch your focus, so your primary focus away from research uh, and towards getting um, institutions to leverage the things you've already uh, figured out with the goal of kind of making the world a better place. What do you think that that might look like? like and I guess, uh, you know, imagining perhaps that you're a like, slightly different person, perhaps a listener out there who's thinking of taking on this on this challenge themselves. I'm not sure I understand you. So you say, get, you get, get, stop, stop being a professor and become something else. It's not, stop doing research and being a professor. Uh, stop trying to like f- learn new lessons and just get people to adopt the lessons that you've already learned. Okay, uh, so, so I'm, no, like, I'm no longer in the knowledge production business. Yeah. I'm in a knowledge, I'm, I'm, a, retail, I'm a retailer. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, retail. someone else is. I'm in, so I went, yeah. a little, I went a little bit into the retail business with super forecasting. I'm, I'm not, I'm not the world's greatest retailer, but uh, <laughs> it was pretty good, so, so, successful. Okay, um, well, that, that's Dan Gardner. <laughs> um, that's a great question because I, I, I am reaching the age where that that is that's a very reasonable question to ask me. Uh, because at a certain age, I think you lose your research edge, and you should be in if you have something to say that you think would be useful to the world, you should be doing retail so, because you have a lot of prestige and a lot of big audience potentially. Uh, it's worth a shot. Yeah, can you share any uh, like research ideas uh, about forecasting or, or some other kind of related topic that, that seem exciting to you that, that you'd like to see someone do, but that you don't think you or any of your uh, direct collaborators are going to get to any anytime soon? Uh, could possibly some, some listener could, could, could take it on. I think that we should be linking forecasting tournaments to policy. We have to bridge the rigor relevance gap. And the best way to do that is by running second generation forecasting tournaments that incentivize people to generate creative questions as well as accurate answers. Um, and uh, creative questions are the third sort of things I think we want to put into Bayesian question clusters and that link short term and long term. Uh, so we can figure out whether we're on a historical trajectory toward a nuclear war or strong AI dislocating labor markets or whatever. What one what, what of the like strongest lessons from your work is to, is to take the outside view and use reference classes. Do you think it's possible that the research overestimates the value of reference classes because questions where reference classes are possible or more easy are like ones where people can just in general be more accurate anyway? Is that something you've tried to control for? I, when I originally started on this work, I, 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 one of the pundits I wanted to recruit was, was William Sapphire, who is a famous New York Times columnist who ran his own forecasting tournament called Office Pool. And 
one, one of he thought my forecasting tournament idea was pretty dumb. Uh, but one of the reasons he thought it was dumb is is that uh, we would be asking questions about events he considered unique. He didn't think they had reference classes, and he was a real stickler for language. And he thought unique meant unique. He thought unique meant one of a kind. Period. Full stop. <laughs> Now, I, on the other hand, am a Vulgarian, and I, I see uniqueness as a matter of degree, hmm. and uh, there are categories of questions. If, if anything, were, I'm not sure there's anything truly unique under the sun. Uh, I, I, I think there are lots of, it, it, the universe of precedence, it, noise, the universe of precedence is extremely large, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it's possible to see well, virtually anything at some, some combination of base rates. Uh, how useful it is, though, is another matter, and how difficult it is to identify those base rates is another matter. Some, sometimes it's really easy to spot what the base rates are with loan applicants, and other times, like uh, with uh, civil wars, it gets gets harder, and then and, and with other kinds of crises, it gets harder still. So I, I think the Kahneman insight on outside view and reference classes is, is, is profound. Do I think it sometimes breaks down? Sure. But I think if you had to bet, that's a, that's a pretty good place to start, And but don't stop there. Just keep updating. You've been a moderately frequent user of um, Twitter over the last few years. Uh, given the high standards of um, reasonableness and even-handedness that, that you try to promote, uh, how do you find your experiences on Twitter and, and I guess, social media in, in general? Well, one of my great disappointments on Twitter was how my friend Nassim Taleb behaved. Uh, I, 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 th- I was just very, I mean, he and I had written a paper together and we'd known each other for years. And I came onto Twitter after the Super Forecasting book came out. And I, and I saw the things he was saying about a lot of people I respected. Uh, and a long list of people, actually, <laughs> like uh, Cass Sunstein and, and Steve Pinker and Stuart Brand and oh, later Nate Silver. And just a long list of people he, he, toward whom he, he calls them BS vendors and blah, blah, blah. But there's a lot, a lot, lot of, you know, a lot of obscenity, a lot of posturing. And I, when I think of someone as smart as he is, uh, you know, with whom I've had, in, I think, reasonably intelligent conversations, and I, and I look at the way he behaves on Twitter. I think he, it's 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 um and it's a cognitive sin. Uh, he is um he, he clearly could be raising the collective intelligence of the Twitterverse, and he's lowering the collective tele- intelligence. So my biggest disappointment was was Nassim, uh, and encountering him on Twitter. Otherwise, I found it a pretty good source of information. I mean, you, you, you hook into the pretty reliable news sources and, 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 and smart people, and they, they generate a lot of interesting things, and uh, even a few research ideas have come out of it. So I, I think it's been fun, uh, by and large, with, 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 with the exception of, um, well, not just Nassim, but, not just Nassim, but, he, yeah. but you know, he, he's the person I knew the best, and he was the person who disappointed me the most. Okay, we're coming up on time, but just just a final question: Have you been making and like tracking predictions yourself about about your own life, and have, how have you been doing? Is that and has that affected like any decisions that you've made? Yeah, yeah, it does. Um, I mean, we we my my wife and I think about our mortality. We're reaching that age. We we're approaching retirement, and we we look we look at resources and we look at time. We look at how we want to spend the remainder of our time, and so we're. There, it's, a, it's a continuous calculator, and it and it and, we, and it, we we adjust in response to health news. And, and, and changing preferences. So, yeah. yeah, we do. I mean, how 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 long? I'm so I'm 65. How long do I expect to live? You know, probably into my early 80s would be, be a bit be our best guess right now. Yeah. But you know, we we it, that can change. <laughs> you look pretty healthy and sharp to me. <laughs> we'll see how long it lasts. And then, well, then there's the issue of dementia. You know, right. that that thing is hanging over all the boomers. So yeah. you know, that, but uh, that doesn't seem to have struck quite yet. Well, fingers crossed, we ought to do another interview, and you'll be just as sharp in ten years' time. It's uh, it's been a great pleasure. Uh, thanks so much for coming back on the podcast, uh, Philip. Oh, always good to talk. I hope you enjoyed that episode. Just a few reminders before we go. If you want to hear more on these topics, check out episode 15, my first interview with Philip. You can apply to attend EA Global, where there's more conversations just like this one, at eaglobal.org. If you want to participate in the counterfactual forecasting tournament involving the game Civilization V, go sign up at 80k.link slash civ. That's 80k.link slash civ. If you'd like to try our calibration training app, you can uh, click on the link in the show notes or go to 80,000hours.org slash calibration hyphen training to try it out. Finally, we'll put a link to that 20-minute blog post uh, summarizing the evidence on good forecasting practices for all of you to read. The 80,000 Hours podcast is produced by Kieran Harris. Thanks for joining. Talk to you in a week or two.